call the meeting to order at 701. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Bingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify me at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so I may inform all of the other participants of said recording. Um, I, Harbor Media will be recording tonight, and I was informed by Greg Lane that the Ham Current will also be recording. If anyone else is planning to record the meeting, would you go to the bottom to the participants button, and when the list pops up, raise your hand um, using the raise hand function. I'll give it a second just to see. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so we can move on. Uh, the first item, 2.1 minutes of the school committee meeting held on October 3rd, 20, that was our planning session. Would someone like to make a motion? I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting uh, planning session uh, held on uh, October 3rd, 2020. Thank you, Carlos. Do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Michelle. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, we can vote now. So, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Nest? Aye. Aye. Um, Libby? Libby, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Okay, Sorry, you I'm here to call my name. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. You're hi, thank you. Uh, Liza? Hi. And I'm an I as well. Thank you. Item 2.2, .2, minutes of the school committee meeting held on October 5th, 2020. I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on uh, um, October 5th, 2020. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and is there any discussion? Oh, okay. Uh, we'll do roll call vote again. Michelle? Aye. Uh, Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Uh, 2.3, the minutes of the school committee meeting held on October 6, 2020. This was the recreation department meeting with the board of selectmen. Would someone like to make a motion? I move that we approve the minutes of the October 6, 2020 uh, joint meeting with the board of select me and uh, the recreation. Uh, Thank you, Carlos. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. Thanks, Michelle. And is there any discussion? No. Okay. Um, roll call, Michelle. Aye. Roll call, Michelle. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Uh, I wasn't there, I'll abstain. Oh, okay. And Liza? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So they're approved. Okay, the next is questions and comments. Uh, the Hingham School Committee encourages community engagement and welcomes questions and comments as agenda items are discussed at the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting for comments or questions that fall under the purview of the school committee and are not already on tonight's agenda. If any guests wish to speak, um, please click on the participant button at the bottom, and when the list pops up, use the raise hand function. Uh, state your name and address and address your comments to the chair. Comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker and must relate to topics within the scope of the responsibility of the school committee. As established by the Mass General Laws, the responsibility of the school committee are to one, select and terminate the superintendent, two, review and approve budgets for public education in the district, and three, establish educational goals and policies for the schools in the district. Speakers are encouraged to present their remarks in a respectful manner and to continue to consider the privacy interests of others. The public comment period is not a time for debate or response to comments by the school committee. The school committee is not adopting or endorsing any of the comments made during the public comment period. So with all of that being said, if anyone has a comment of something that's not already on the agenda tonight, and again, if you could click on the participants button and then use the raise hand function. I'll just wait a few minutes to see.
Okay, I see Julie Donovan. Hi, if you put him in yourself and give your name and address, please. Oh, sure. My, uh, my name is Julie Donovan. I live at 6 Blue Sky Drive. Just a quick question. I'm sorry that I don't see the agenda on the screen. I'm sure it's published. Will we be discussing the opportunity to bring the students back uh, full time uh, in school? Is that on the agenda? Uh, yes, Dr. Austin will be giving uh, an update on the school reopening. Okay, fabulous. Then I'll wait and, um, and then uh, have my questions. Thank you for clarifying, Karen. Okay, thanks, Julie. Is there anyone else who has wanted to speak? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone, so we'll move on to uh, the superintendent's report, 4.1. Dr. Austin? Just have to remember to unmute myself. I was having a great speech all to myself. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending tonight, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. And uh, as I have said in the uh, in many previous meetings, uh, the intent of, of our 1019 meeting, which is tonight, was to give you an update on where we're at with our reopening. We've been open now for three weeks, uh, and to talk with you some initial ideas. Uh, present or, or present to you some initial ideas we have potential um, moving towards more in-person learning uh, that uh, I think Julie Jonathan just asked about. Uh, so so in doing that, I want to do a couple of things. Um, but before I start, I want to uh, thank some, some folks um, here and, and don't want to be remiss in not saying that. First of all, I want to thank the staff, um, the teachers, the principals, um, our incredible uh, central office folks uh, for the for all of your incredible efforts. Nothing you're doing is easy. Um, we've learned much over these last three weeks. Uh, nothing's been perfect um, except for your efforts. Uh, that's been incredible. And I would say the same thing for our students and our parents. Um, we recognize that none of this uh, pandemic uh, is easy. We're in constant, uh, we, we feel we're in constant crisis uh, and yet um, we're, we're gonna manage through this. So I thank you for your efforts as well, your support of our staff, our teachers, our principal, our central office folks uh, in moving forward uh, and recognizing this uh, truly is, uh, and I'll use the word that I hate to use, this is to use unprecedented time that we're in uh, and that we continue to be in. Um, and we, like you, uh, from central office, um, do certainly hope that uh, the light is at the end of the tunnel so we can get back to school as we all want it to be. Because what we did learn over the last three weeks is nothing we're going to do is going to make school look like school looked like last uh, what fall at this time. Uh, we can't simply replicate that. Um, but we're doing the best we can and we thank you for your patience. Um, the second part, I would thank you to the uh, to Liza um, and Michelle Ayer, uh, to Julie, and to all the administrators for their work on a frequently asked questions documents that are being posted on online right now. Um, these are, are a great work of progress, um, have a lot of information in them, um, and I encourage you to look online uh, and to see that uh, what's been done. Uh, I think you'll find those helpful and will answer a lot of the questions that people have. Uh, so I thank you for that and for the, all the work that you put into that uh, and, and to, to ensure that the community has the information they need. <clears throat> I'll talk just briefly about enrollment. Enrollment has stabilized. Uh, we have two or three homeschooling applications tonight, but at the same time, we also had um, a couple of students come back into school. Um, and so it, it's fairly um, steady right now. Um, what we expected um, that to happen now was to to stabilize and, and to level off. Uh, and so that's the enrollment piece. Uh, so not a lot of movement with that. I, I do think um, we do see some students moving from remote to in-person and vice versa of in-person moving, uh, moving to remote. I think it just speaks to the fluidity of the, of the situation we have right now, um, which I'm gonna speak to in just a moment on the uh, current COVID numbers, uh, which we're, we're certainly watching, but uh, enrollment seems to be pretty static uh, and, and constant now. And I'll give you another update next month on uh, enrollment overall, if there's any changes in that, I'll even tell you it's just the same. Um, so Julie, I'm gonna ask you first before we uh, pull up the, um, the other proposal information. Uh, let's go over the COVID numbers just so people can see what we've been doing in COVID um, and monitoring that. And as, as some of you may have 
uh, heard before. Um, we've talked about our health metrics. I just make sure that everybody is, uh, there you go. So, um, yeah. Thank you uh, for, for muting. Um, on the, just on the, uh, the weekly uh, health report, um, and most people know that uh, Hingham is now in the red. Um, we've been watching a uh, increase uh, really since 9-9. So the last month, uh, four or five weeks, um, the trend is, is upward, uh, which is a concerning trend, obviously. Um, we moved from 6.3 uh, COVID uh, positive cases per 100,000 population last week to 9.9. Um, this week, uh, and that is a significant number. Um, we need to watch this carefully. We'll watch a three-week trend, which is what we've been doing. Um, and, and simply put, if we end up with three weeks in the red, we will have to make some, um, we'll have to analyze that again for the information it gives us and make some determinations on if changes should be made. I also want to be clear that three, three, weeks, in a, uh, three weeks in the red uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we go remote either. Uh, it simply means we have to uh, to certainly analyze the the data. Uh, to date, um, we still have been very pleased to see that transmission uh, has not occurred in our school system. Um, we simply we we have uh, cases as you'll see um, next, but uh, the, there hasn't been any transmission or close contact because we've been at six feet of uh, distancing, um, and that is. Uh, particularly true across the entire district. I will say when we talk later about moving to uh, in-person phase, that changes to three feet distancing, which means we are gonna change our close contacts. So if somebody is uh, infected within a school, uh, school and they're in school for an infectious time, and somebody's is within six feet of them for over 15 minutes, uh, which would be true if we were three foot distancing, that will impact others who will have to uh, go home and quarantine for the, for the period. Uh, so uh, the trend that we have right now when we're watching with the COVID, with the, uh, COVID response team uh, is trending up uh, and we'll wait for uh, Wednesday's numbers to see where we are this week. So this is uh, our school data. These are all on our website, by the way, um, so people can see that. And this is the most up-to-date um, information. Uh, you can see over the last three weeks, we've climbed by 10 cases. Um, in, the, in the first two weeks, we had zero cases. Uh, in school, and that could be an adult or a child. Um, we don't we don't identify which one, but it's somebody within our school. It's either a staff or a student. Um, and so, for the first two weeks, we had zero cases. Um, week three on nine twenty seventh through ten three, we had three. Two at the high school, one at the middle school. Uh, ten four through ten, we added uh, three more at the middle school, two at the elementaries, uh, and one at the high school. And then uh, through eleven uh, ten eleven through ten seventeen, we had. Uh, four more cases, um, two at the high school and two at the elementary level. Uh, and so again, with the trend that we're seeing in town uh, with more cases, we're also seeing that in the school system. That does give me cause um, uh, or, or reason to um, be concerned, uh, as it should with all of us, uh, and, and does have to, uh, or eventually will have to play into our decision uh, moving forward or not, uh, particularly if we're talking about uh, putting more children uh, in, in spaces and, and decreasing the amount of uh, social distancing that we have between um, children. Uh, so those are the cases that now overall, um, we have had 13 uh, positive cases as an associated with, with Hingham Public Schools. Uh, we are watching this closely, um, but uh, certainly again, the, the trend that we're seeing is it's an upward trend. Thank you, you can stop sharing that. So, that's where we are with the COVID numbers. And, and I want to remind everyone that I have a COVID response team that meets every week. That team includes the uh, school nurses, includes the uh, administrators, uh, the principals of the buildings, our, our, um, our school physician, uh, the Hingham Board of Health uh, is on that, uh, the HEA uh, representative and myself. Um, we watch these numbers every week. And it's just not numbers, I want to say, because what's behind the numbers is what's more important. What are the ages of people who are becoming infected? How is that impacting our school, et cetera, uh, that we watch every week? Um, so that is something we take very seriously uh, as we analyze that data and it, and it helps us provide uh, or it helps provide the, the science that we need uh, to make decisions about going forward. Uh, but right now we've been confident that none of our schools are uh, 
we've done a good job of mitigating, I don't want to say, for the spread of COVID in our schools, and we feel confident in continuing to move forward uh, as we've done all along um, at this point. But I will give you, again, I will do this every two weeks for you, uh, Carrie, so that you know that what the numbers are and what we're thinking uh, in regards to uh, school moving forward. It is, it, is a, it is a scary time for people when they see the numbers trending up. Um, we see districts all across the Commonwealth um, begin to think about uh, either pulling back or, or pausing. Uh, uh, as I said before, this is a fluid uh, situation and it can change at any time. And, and regardless of how we all feel about things, I will not take a, a chance uh, on the health and safety of our staff or students. Um, to move forward without a uh, fairly good assurance uh, from the medical community and from the science that it's safe to do so. So um, that's where we are with the numbers. Now, did you have a question, Carrie, before I move yeah, on? Do you, do you want to take questions on that information first, or do you want to do the whole thing? No, why don't we can take questions on that first. Sorry. Does anyone on the committee have a question? Michelle? You do. <clears throat> thanks. Um, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Dr. Austin. I just wanted to just I'm assuming this is the case because you, you had said that three weeks in red doesn't necessarily mean we'll go remote, but I would imagine that the inverse is true as well, right? That there could be a scenario where the community isn't red, but the schools or a building could potentially be back to remote, correct? That is correct. You know, we, okay. we watch every every um, situation, every case that comes across, <laughs> we talk about. Um, we talk about the spread, we talk about the risk um, to others. Um, every time. So it could be at any time. And I want to be clear with the public on this. At any time, I could shut down a school because we are at risk in a school for spreading that. And I'll tell you a, a true story from my own family that had it happen today on my one of my grandchildren. Um, school was closed down for the next few days uh, because they have a positive case somewhere that had uh, too much spread. Uh, and so it can happen. Uh, and it does happen. It's happening all across the Commonwealth. Um, and so you know, that's a very good point, Michelle, at any given time, it doesn't even mean we could be in yellow, but if that yellow is all coming from within the school, then you have to be very concerned. Um, and so it's not, and, and I get asked the question all the time, so I appreciate this. I get asked all the question, do you have the metrics of when you're going to either move forward or back? And I'm saying there, there isn't a perfect science to that other than to look at what the science is telling us about where those cases are coming from, um, who's being infected, uh, and what the causes are. Uh, and we look at that every single week. In fact, we spend a, a tremendous amount of time doing that uh, to make those decisions. So at this point, I feel confident we continue moving as we are, um, but at any time that could change. Thank you for that question. Does anyone else on the committee have questions? I'm not seeing any. I see a couple in the um, our visitors. There's David Bolo. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. If you could state your name and address to the record. Yeah, uh, Dave Bollier at uh, 18 Matt Hill. Um, oh. Dr. Austin, on, on the um, chart that you sh showed with uh, 13 cumulative cases, four or five a week, what is the, what's the total population that that is coming from? Uh, if, you, if you put all of our staff and students together, it's, it's somewhere around 4,500. So okay. it, you so are the, correct, it's fairly small um, when it comes to the, the total number we have here. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Julie Donovan. Hi. Dr. Austin, for that, that same number, that cumulative number of 13 cases so far this year, it seems like we should also be tracking, I don't know why it's cumulative, because some of those cases I would think and hope that were in fact early on have now recovered and they're healthy and they're back in the population, the schools, et cetera. So um, are we tracking it? Why are we tracking it cumulatively? I, I, you know, Julie, the, the, the point is, us is that they're overall, the state and then the town, the town, the state, the country all accumulates there, you know, how many cases we've had cumulatively. Um, I, I haven't, you know, gone into it so much to say, okay, who's recovered and come back? I, I believe they all have. I mean, I, I think that's true with everyone is they're certainly coming back and, and recovering and, or, or it could be asymptomatic, to be honest. Uh, and so I haven't gone that far into the science. I'm just simply tracking how many cases we have. Just like the, the DESE is right now. DESE is, is tracking how many cases we have as a total. That's why you see the week-to-week -week from us. 
Um, and what I'm looking for is that trend. Are we moving up significantly? I mean, we moved up one week from, you know, 100%. We went from three to six, but then back down to four. Uh, and so we want to track that over time to see is that, is that a trend? Are we going to go down? Are we going to, are we going to level off? What's going to happen? I mean, we just don't know yet. I don't have data. Good. Thanks for sharing because I agree the trend is important. That cumulative number, I feel like, is out of context. So thank you for clarifying that it's really the trend. And we're, of course, all grateful that these people are recovering. Yeah, because that's why, absolutely. That's why I put in, uh, both their numbers there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Jamie Apetisano. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Austin. Uh, Jamie Apetisano, 8 Independence Lane. I have a question about the communications that go out um, when there is a COVID case. And I, I'm mindful of the need to protect privacy, but I wonder if it's possible to share more information in COVID communications and still protect privacy. And if you look at the communications that go out in the case of lice, that's an example of, of you know, you, you provide more information there. You alert parents in the classroom and you protect the privacy of the individual with lice. And that's just as important, right? So every health situation is important to protect privacy. And that's a case where you provide more information. And so I wonder why more information can't be provided and strike a balance where you can protect just like you do in the case of lice. Yeah, um, thank you for that question, uh, Jamie. And, and a couple of comments I would say on that. I'm, I was actually really shocked when I saw that the district was pulling out lice information still. Uh, I got I to tell you from a district that I worked in, uh, every district I worked in prior to this, we stopped doing that years ago because that um, certainly can, can have some stigma attached to it. Uh, and I, I, tip, I really don't believe it that we should be putting that out because that's anybody uh, could, could certainly have that. Um, this health emergency, this information we're putting out, I, I can tell you that uh, I've taken those questions. I've had those questions from people. I've researched that. I've gone to DESE. I've talked to the Board of Health. They're the ones that are continuing to advise me, this is the way you need to communicate it. I mean, De I will tell you honestly, I called Desi and I said, people want more information. I get it, I understand why they do. And their advice to me was, here's what you need to put out. Uh, and if you don't put that out, if you go beyond that, we're gonna let you know, you shouldn't be doing that, don't do that. It's, it's a verbal violation. So I'm not trying to hold things back. I'm just telling you, that's the advice I'm getting. Yeah, and I just wanna say on that too, as we went work through the policies, and the, um, we found out that we sh really shouldn't be sending out those letters for about lice because it does violate student policy. If a student in a classroom, if the parents all get a letter about some a student has lice and then somebody's out of school for a while, it's it identifies them. And similar in this case, that if if the classroom, if everybody gets a letter and then somebody suddenly goes remote for two weeks, then it's pretty clear who the student is. Um, and the other thing too, and this is unfortunate, it's happened in a few cases where students have been harassed. By people when they had when they had a COVID positive case, so it's it's really important for people to just not blame people for transmitting it and just and have some grace with that too. Um, so that's that's another concern with with sending out more information. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up question? Sure. Sure. So, uh, Dr. Austin, you know we were talking about there not being evidence of transmission in the classroom. I'm curious, are, are we working with the town health department to identify where transmission is happening in the case of the folks in our school population? Absolutely we are. Um, I will tell you, I have probably 10 to 15 calls a week with Sue Sarney uh, from the Department of Health. Our nurses are doing contact tracing. We do it uh, seven days a week. Uh, unfortunately, we are doing it on the weekends as well, talking to our teachers, talking to our principals. Uh, so absolutely we are. Um, and we're looking to where it's coming from uh, and to determine if there's any close contacts as well as if it could be coming from anywhere in our school system. Uh, that would be very concerning to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, to Laura Asatella. Hi. You your name and address. Can, ask a question. can you hear me okay? Yep. Could you just state your name and address, please? Yes. Laura Asatella for Boulder Glen Road. Um, first of all, thank you for the update. Tonight. Thank you for all the work you're doing uh, to mitigate the spread at the schools. And it's wonderful as a parent to feel safe sending them every day. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more, though, about um, what your team has discussed. I'm sure it's come up, um, but why there hasn't been any proactive uh, tests among staff and students, perhaps a sample population or um, just to get a baseline. I know they've been doing that in some of our benchmark communities and elsewhere around the country. So I just would like to hear your thoughts on that as a tactic and 
why it isn't being done in Hingham at this time, particularly as we're moving into the red territory. Thank you very much. Actually, um, that's a really good question, and it's one that I've asked as well, Laura, um, to when I've asked the Board of Health to see if that's even possible for us. Some of it, I guess, is availability of what, and some towns have different connections to different organizations that have tests, et cetera. Uh, I'm not adverse to that at all. In fact, I did, um, when we talked about athletes and, and things like that, I want to make sure that all, all of us, because we have so many kids on the fields, we have kids everywhere, um, to be testing. I'm not adverse to that. I just haven't had the access to that right now. Um, and, and the cost of that obviously would be pretty uh, substantial, uh, to, to be clear. Um, the cost, you know, so I don't know what that means overall, but I'm, I'm curious that way myself. Um, so I'm not sure that that's going to be wiped out for forever. Um, we have the availability. If we were to have a cluster, we've not had a cluster. Um, here within school, even though we've had 13 cases overall, we haven't had a cluster. If we had a cluster, if there was three or four people all at once, same kind of tr transmission in school or whatever, we'd have the we have the ability, uh, the availability of the state to come and test for us um, with their mobile testing. We haven't qualified for that yet, even though that uh, I kept that in the back of my mind and certainly asked um, the Board of Health for that uh, when it's appropriate. Um, so I'm not adverse to it. I just I don't think the availability is there for us right now. So availability and funding specifically, the funding? Yeah, I, I'm not even so worried about the funding uh, as I am the, the availability. I think funding will, funding will take care of itself. I think you've got insurances and things like that. I think it's really about availability, but it's something we'll continue to talk about on our COVID task force um, to, to see if we can uh, possibly do that. I would actually, I would tell you honestly, I would actually love to see that um, at least in a uh, random uh, test. Uh, more often, uh, with not more often, we haven't done it um, as a part of our protocol. Well, as parents, um, who should we be reaching out to at this date to encourage this and to, to push for this? That would be the Department of Public Health. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other hands now, so if you want to move on to the next part. Well, thank you. And, and for this next part, I'm going to ask Dr. Lil Barr and the administrators to help me out uh, with this. And, and um, knowing that this three-week um, three week window that we had to open it hybrid uh, and then come together with just some thoughts that we have, the initial planning uh, thoughts of uh, potentially moving forward, uh, I've asked Dr. Lil Barr to work with the principals and has worked with Susan DeMato from Human Resources and Suzanne Venice and uh, John Ferris from the central office uh, and all of our principals to to really be thoughtful uh, about moving forward. And before before we get into that PowerPoint that Dr. LeBillard and I will kind of work through together, hopefully, uh, uh, and we haven't practiced, so I'm sure we'll figure it out, Jamie, together um, moving forward. Um, but um, the reality is that, you know, every, every single one of our principals Every one of our, our people uh, uh, from the central office, the teachers, we all want to see our students come in uh, in person if all possible. And so we will have the best of intentions. There's a snapshot of where we're at right now. So, Dr. Lebel, I don't know if you gave it to Julie to share or do you have them? Um, I, I don't know that I can share. Share. Uh, Julie, if you wanted to make me a code, maybe I could uh, share the presentation. Sure. I have a queued up ready to go. I'm just going to share it, Julie, because I don't even see the list for some reason. I know that's crazy. No problem. So much not fitting under any of these. Do you want to just share your PowerPoint because I've got it up here? Sounds good.
Paul, I think you're, I think you're muted still. Sorry, thank you. Uh, so Jamie and I have not really practiced this together, but uh, as I said, Jamie, why don't you go ahead and, and um, you, you've worked with the principals the most with this and, and gotten this prepared, so uh, I'll jump in and in between if that's okay. Sure thing. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the goal for tonight is to update the committee and the community on our planning for phase three, uh, which if we go back to our original uh, planning documents, referred to uh, the, the return of both cohort A and B um, uh, for full days um, uh, at three feet of social distancing as opposed to the six. Um, and so as we began to have that conversation, uh, we wanted to sort of update the community, the community on here's where we're at in terms of a projected targeted launch, um, as well as the variables that we have to address in order to actualize phase three. Um, what I will say is at this stage of the game, um, we really are talking uh, at sort of a 30,000 foot level. Uh, we have to be thoughtful of the impact of all these uh, changes and proposals have on um, uh, with our teachers association and with our community and with scheduling and uh, so the, the impact, uh, the ripple effect that these that each individual decision has on multiple stakeholders. Um, so this we thought would be helpful just to give everybody an update of sort of where we are right now, our current reopening status in the district. Uh, so right now our preschool is actually back full time in person. So our three and four year olds have had a full return uh, for all kids uh, receiving special education services. And we are beginning to phase in typically developing peer models. Uh, and again, in all of our preschool classrooms, we are maintaining uh, six feet of social distancing. At K to five, we are currently in hybrid right now, phase two. Um, and that in, uh, includes uh, the uh, sort of the establishment of four cohorts, cohort A, cohort B, cohort AB, and then cohort R which are fully remote students. Um, this model right now consists of two in-person partial days with three remote days at three feet of social distancing. And really the same is true at six to eight and nine through 12. Um, I will note that also a cohort AB is attending full days in person. And the number of days that they attend is really reflective of the student disability or other um, uh, related needs. Uh, it ranges from either two days all the way up to five days a week. And we're ready for the next slide. So as the discussion has begun, particularly uh, in grades K through two, that's really where uh, we're beginning our conversation of the roll up to, to phase three. Um, there are several key points that we really need to make sure that we're very transparent about in terms of why we can or cannot move faster um, relative to this rollout. The first key variable is transportation. So let's begin with the Department of Education's guidelines on transportation has resulted in a 75% reduction in our ridership capacity. So that said, we used to be able to fit 75, maybe 76 students on a bus. Now we can fit about 25 plus. Um, in order to address the transportation need, um, and right now it, it's not a huge issue because again, the students are in cohorts. Um, so on any given day, the transportation has the capacity to actually transport the number of students attending. It's when we double that, that number of students attending where our transportation really begins um, to get more challenged. Now, I will note that we really have worked out three possible solutions to, to solve the transportation variable. The first is uh, we would need to, uh, to rent um, seven additional buses um, and bring on seven additional bus drivers. Um, the bus drivers who are brought on will have to undergo about 60 hours of required training in order to operate a school bus. Um, and uh, that would, uh, and I'll let uh, Mr. Ferris in a bit talk a little bit about um, his thoughts on the transportation as the Director of Business and Support Services, uh, but we're talking to the tune of just over $300,000 um, to actually get the additional buses. Now with those additional buses, um, we maintain the school committee's policy relative to transportation of students um, who are beyond one mile from the school, as well as uh, we maintain the current start times of our elementary schools. Um, and in order to, to, to get everyone to school, um, within the policy guidelines and within the current start times, we do need the addition of seven buses and seven bus drivers to transport the students. Um, another option to solve the transportation goes a variable. So again, the first option was really the seven additional buses and bus drivers. The second option becomes to adjust the school committee policy. 
So right now, the volume of students that we're required to transport in grades K through six outnumbers the number of open seats we have on our existing buses. If the, if the committee considered an adjustment to their policy of moving that distance to one and a half miles from the school, we actually feel fairly confident that we can transport everyone we need to transport in grades K through six. And the final option, which is sort of the least ideal option of all, is to actually adjust the start, the start times of all four elementary schools um, and put them on at least a half an hour gap between each other. Um, that is because the total student population in a school that needs to be transported um, needs uh, the lion's share of the total number of buses to actually transport the kids. Um, so if we are, we're not able to change policy or not able to square the buses, the, the sort of the, another option is really around changing start times. Um, and that would have, uh, you know, an early school uh, just before 8 a.m. and a late school uh, well after 9.30. So, so we're, we're, th we're sort of thoughtful around the impact that that would have on existing family schedules and teacher schedules. And it's sort of the least ideal, but we wanted to be transparent around these are the options that are being discussed to solve the transportation variable. Another major variable, uh, another major issue that we have is both is in classroom and instructional space. So again, uh, not to sort of belabor a point, but at, at six feet of social distancing, which is the current model we're in right now in phase two, our student population simply does not fit within our, uh, within our classrooms. Um, we have, in order to make it work, we have taken over all of our specialist teacher uh, teaching spaces. Um, we also need to be thoughtful if we do advance, um, how do we begin to reintroduce our specialists, given their spaces back and their instructional spaces back. Um, all schools, uh, regardless of our district phase of reopening, are required to maintain the six feet of social distancing or, 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 or um, physical distancing for lunch which creates a, a real dilemma in terms of how many students can fit in the school cafeterias, as well as timing it takes to actually work all of the students through the, the, through the lunch periods. Um, right now, we are uh, tentatively discussing taking over other spaces in the building to be overflow for lunch. Um, but again, going full day with the requirement to serve, uh, with the nutrition requirements that we have, uh, we are thoughtful of the need, we, the, the space that we need to serve lunches at six feet. We also need to be thoughtful of space for snack and mass breaks. And then there are unique issues specific to Foster Elementary relative to classroom space. So eight of those classrooms at Foster are unable to be used and all those teachers in those classrooms have been relocated uh, to every available open space in the building. Um, so even if we were to advance um, and, and figure out the lunch issue, particularly at Foster, we now run into a bigger issue of classroom space. And we do have a potential um, resolution to that, which I'll get into the next slide. Um, and then the final key variable for discussion uh, or for consideration is instructional staff. Uh, so right now we are looking at as we, the, the current plan as it stands is to introduce remote teachers um, who would take over the, the core instruction of our remote students in grades K through five. Uh, though that, um, that launch would also require an adjustment to the existing class sections. Um, we would have to then be thinking about um, remote paraeducators for any remote class over a particular uh, enrollment. And we're still, that said though, we're still actually actively working on filling in-person vacancies that currently exist with our instructional staff. So um, again, the design of the district's phase three plan, particularly at the K to two level, would be to, as we brought kids back, to, would be to launch remote te teachers to then free our classroom teachers up to really focus on uh, both cohort A and B who would be in front of them uh, teaching. And so I, before I get into sort of the targeted plan and what we're thinking about in terms of discussion points right now, I wanted to make sure that I, I reviewed those three key variables with, with both the committee and the community so people understand some of the, 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 the barriers that are in the way. They're not impossible to overcome, but they are real. So I want to make sure that I sort of spend a few minutes just to address those three variables. And Julie, we can go on to the next. Dr. Lewa, if you don't mind, I'm going to just kick in for a minute. Um, yeah, this is one of these things that we've talked about. Can we go back to that, please, before we go on to that? Where do we go? We, we move forward. There we go. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about all along, and, and we said we're going to have to solve these problems before we can talk about uh, moving to full in, um, even at the elementary level um, that people have been uh, highly requesting, is we had to figure out transportation. Even though our ridership is down, 
we still have to be prepared to, uh, to um, transport any student that requests it. Uh, and, and so that was going to be an issue for us. Uh, and, and so, you know, the transportation is a, is a big deal. Um, there's no easy solution for it. It's going to be inconvenient no matter what we do, um, frankly, and uh, unless Desi, uh, and I'm hearing some movement with that, that Desi is talking about potentially relaxing um, the requirement for busing um, and, re and, and increasing the number that can actually ride, which would be really um, the best case scenario for us in many ways. Um, but that is number one. Two, um, we've said all along about the classroom space. Um, I can't overemphasize that, that um, simply put, um, that our students don't fit into, as, as Dr. Lula just said, uh, as six foot spacing, and even at three foot, to be very clear, even at three feet, I don't have enough space uh, in all of our schools. We do in some, we don't have them in all. Uh, and so space is an issue. Uh, we do have some possible um, solutions to this, um, but again, it's not an easy solution, and it means that it's gonna inconvenience some people um, at, at the very least. Uh, and so uh, space and transportation. And finally, as he just said, just to reiterate staff, um, we had 30 openings uh, the last time we met. I am happy to say uh, a lot of people in the community really helped with this. We have several people that we did fill positions uh, and we're working to do that, but we still have many more uh, to fill. Um, so I'd encourage that, but that um, these people are, are truly needed to, to help us be fully uh, functional. Uh, and move forward. So I want to reiterate everything that he just said are, are things that we've been saying for, for weeks, if not months, uh, about what we'll need to be able to move forward. So I'll leave it at that. And I know John Ferris, if you wanted to add anything about transportation at all. Uh, I think uh, the, the transportation, Paul, I'll just wait. I mean, I think we're going to be talking about the whole picture. So I'm happy to yeah. you know, come in and talk about any questions. That, uh, people may have about transportation that I think it's pretty well said so far. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about where our planning has been focused. So at, to begin, we're really thoughtful about our primary age population, our students in grades K through two. Um, and the, the as Dr. Austin mentioned at the top of the present, Presentation. I have been meeting along with the other central office directors and our elementary uh, principals and assistant principals in planning this return roughly since the uh, beginning of September. So we've been meeting weekly, um, sort of uh, talking through these variables and sort of getting to a point where we actually have a formulated plan to, to communicate out tonight. Um, so our target date for possible launch right now is on or about January 4. Um, and that is subject to change based on uh, health metrics and staffing. And uh, again, all of this is subject to collective bargaining. Um, we are going to be considering the advancement of kindergarten uh, to five partial days per week uh, and consider the advancement of grades one and two to five full days per week, which would require an adjustment to our social distancing, our physical distancing from th uh, six to three feet. Um, part of the rationale for the timeline is uh, re directly related back to those three key variables that we cannot proceed until those variables are, are, are uh, resolved. The first being transportation. So we either need to add a seven buses and drivers, we need to, uh, or adjust the policy um, to only transport kids who, who are uh, beyond one and a half miles from school, or change the start times of all of our elementary buildings. In terms of space, um, all schools will need to really make adjustments to the, in, the their infrastructure um, for, to serve lunch and maintain the six feet of social distancing that's required under DESE guidance. Um, I will note that we are currently under negotiations with the Archdiocese of Boston. Uh, St. Jerome's is a Catholic school located on Route 3A in Weymouth, just um, actually right outside of the foster attendance zone um, in, other, in another community. Uh, um, but we are looking at St. Jerome's as being an overflow uh, for, for space to foster. Um, we had uh, uh, got wind of the diocese. Or we looked at it as a possible solution then, but at the time, as it turns out, the Weymouth Public Schools were also looking, working, at, working with uh, the Archdiocese and see if St. Jerome might be a resolution for some of their space issues. And it turns out that it wouldn't suit their needs, but as it turns out for us, it actually would suit our needs perfectly. Um, that, that would... I 
things we're very thoughtful of here is as we advance to a return to school, the potential influx of enrollment is, is where we're thoughtful. So in all of our planning, uh, we are being very thoughtful of the total K-5 to enrollments and not the current enrollment, right? Um, so we're less concerned about our private school kids who might return as families that pay tuitions and sort of invested in that for the year. We're more thoughtful about, about our students who have withdrawn for homeschool um, and a potential uh, return to the district um, once we return to that. So that's, again, why we're planning for the full population of K-5, or in this instance right now, K-2, to and not um, sort of who we have in front of us right now. One remote teacher per grade and one remote paraeducator for classes over, say, 30 or so. We have not sort of nailed down that number, uh, but we are thinking through um, launching the remote teachers. So if we do have to make adjustments to the, the uh, elementary class sections, we can actually do that sooner than later. Um, and uh, we are going to be proceeding, I believe, Dr. Austin, correct if I'm wrong, with the posting of these positions, I believe, soon this week, correct? Yeah, that is correct. We, we really need to get moving on that. And, and, and uh, again, that's one of those things we've really learned over the, um, the time of what this is going to be something we absolutely have to have. You know, move right. And it really allows our teaching faculty to sort of um, have one dedicated person who is. Um, we're really hoping we get Hingham people who, who uh, hope to apply for these positions, who know our curriculum, who know our expectations, who know our scope and sequence. Um, our learning progressions and can actually bring that to our remote students and provide for them a more robust remote education while also simultaneously freeing up our classroom teachers to really be able to focus on the kids who are in front of them and then the cohort A or B who might not be with them uh, until we advance them to the full um, uh, return to school. But again, I want to be clear that, this, that the discussions right now are really focused on K-2 to launching in January with other grades and grade spans uh, um, targeted for a later date into the, into the winter. Um, and uh, Julie, you can go on to phase, to the next slide there. Um, in terms of three to five, the target date for launch is really going to be TBD, right? We, we first have to um, be thoughtful about the infrastructure needed in terms of instructional space and transportation and staff uh, for K-2. So once the idea right now is once we get K-2 operational, um, and again, the same logistical issues present themselves for three to five that present themselves for K to two. Um, and so we are, um, this is again, a 30,000 foot view of sort of where we are in our planning. There are, there's a lot more sort of building based intricacies and planning that needs to be done. Um, but right now we are uh, aiming for a January four launch of a full return five days a week, five full days a week um, for grades K through two. Uh, and K will advance to five days, but will not return to a full full day program um, this school year. And I believe the next slide is just discussion, feedback, and questions. And if you want to come out of the share screen, we can maybe um, take some comments uh, that way. And I also will open it up to our oh sorry, maybe my screen is off. Um, open it up to our elementary administrators as well to jump in, <laughs> clarifying thoughts or anything. I, I hope I did a good job of, of sort of encapsulating the. The discussions that have been unfolding for the last couple months with the elementary team. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, does anyone on the committee have some questions? Liza? Um, thank you um, for the presentation. And I recognize this is really complicated and it's going to take some time to flush it out. Um, but I have some questions about the transportation. Are we going to talk about that now or? next i think we can okay yeah, um, so i recognize this is really complicated um if for my first question is if we do the opening are we still busing the whole middle school six through eight with the, in the hybrid plan does that stay like the first runs in the morning Uh, so if we know, we would have to, we would need all of the buses for the elementary. So we would revert back to grade six, right, John? I could be mistaken, but I thought we'd have to make that transition. Well, if we get that, I mean, if the, for the elementary, if you start getting the elementary in, we could do that with, uh, and, and keep the middle school six to eight going. But if, if middle school six to eight goes three feet, then we can only do six there. Correct, correct. Right. Okay. That's it. That's still, that's still. It. Okay. Um, then, um, 
I am looking at the, the variables and on the one and a half miles, do we know sort of how many families this would impact? And then also, is it equal impact across all four schools or are there schools that would be more impacted than the others with the one and a half miles? Um, well, well, I mean, when you talk equality, I, I'm not sure, you know, the equal, it's, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the, the numbers of uh, the riders, like, I mean, it's significant when you look at it. So PRS, if you're doing the transportation the way we're doing it now, we need 14 buses. If we went to 1.5, we'd need eight buses. Okay, Foster School, we need 13 buses. If we were to change, we'd need two buses. Um, East School, South School, we need 13 buses now. If we change, we need six buses. And and with East School, we need 17 buses now. And if we change, we need eight buses. And and even you know, so, those are the raw numbers when you actually count the families, um, you know, and count the the, the riders here. Um, but I mean, still with with Foster and East, we'd still have to. It, it's not going to really go down to that level because there's certain riders that you know would want to um, continue to pick up. Like, for example, with, with Foster School in that territory, Plotler Road and, and um, the hill there, uh, Baker Hill, you know, they don't really have a sidewalk of getting down a 3A where we could have a crossing guard. So, you know, that, that may be an area where, you know, we don't really want those kids crossing 3A by themselves. There's not a sidewalk going all the way down there, so we may have to provide a bus there. Similarly, with the E-School, you know, we have the, um, the World's End area there. We don't really want the kids coming across. Years. So we'd still have to like throw some extra buses to, so that they're still tight between those two. You know, when Foster and East are on the same schedule like right now, they're still going to use up just about the entire fleet between the two of them. Okay. Um, and then, did you think about like looking at the busing for all the K through two, and then sort of three through five doing the one and a half miles? So you know, starting with busing all the K through two, like splitting it that way? You mean on different start times, Liza? Or or as we it? phase it in, you know, as we, you know, phase uh, in the buses? Yeah, as we phase in, if we phase in buses, I mean, we still have time constraints with a lot of things. So transportation may be able to be worked out, but then space may be an issue. You know, so there's, there's a, it, it's sort of like hard to look at them individually. When we look at the timeline, like for example, you know, tomorrow, could I try to do this? Um, you know, of course, you can't do it tomorrow, but I mean, if we said, you know, could we do it December 1st to get one grade in or two grades in? You know, we might be able to do that, but do we have the space for it? And, and is there, you know, other agreements in place just to sort of go there? Yeah, I'm not thinking about advancing the phase in date. I was thinking of more delaying getting the extra buses to reduce our cost of, you know, the, the $300,000. Can we make it with the K through two group with what we have and then push back the extra buses until we're ready for three through five? Um, I think we could make it with what we have for the K through two. Is that, you know, I mean, yeah. I would love to do the extra yeah. 300 grand, and, but I'm realistic of, you know, we need a lot of buy-in from the town to yes. get that done. Um, I mean, we talked about that option before, then we expanded it and stuff, but there's a, you know, we, when, if, if we're willing to, if, if, um, if we phase in like that, we, we may be able to do something, just everybody has to understand that. When, when we change and be a little shifting and it might be a little inconvenience for some people, it may not just be transparent. You know, okay, now we're going to go to this step. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I, it's it's challenging. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, the later changing the start times would be tough and the really late start time would be very difficult. Um, and the, even the one and a half miles, you're going to get into some car transport issues around those schools I mean as it is with the middle school we have that challenge but you know with East school well all the schools you have car issues 
on those main roads. Um, so the, maybe the solution is work with the town to get the 300 grand. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's always a, that's always an option. I think we need to be aware also of you know the the risks that may be uh, uh, involved too, because you know so we we've got healthy bus drivers. We have to get seven first. That's a formidable task. And we have healthy bus drivers, right? If something happens to a bus driver or they get COVID and they expose others, our whole transportation system could go down, and that's it. You know, you, you know, you know. What I'm saying, depending on who had to be quarantined and stuff, because there's just not another bus driver you could sort of roll out and do this stuff. So we need to, we need to, you know, hope, you know, make sure that they stay protected. And um, you know, there's there's that risk too. That's I just wanted to. I think this is the appropriate time to, you know, explain that risk. Um, the you know, in the difficulty that there is in trying to get seven bus drivers. Right, you know, getting them all trained. We typically, by so we may get one or two over the summer, and we have the time to train them. So there's three months there. Um, you know, the, the the thought of like here's an advertisement trying to get qualified candidates to say, hey, I need a job, and I'd love to drive a school bus, and if you train me, I'm willing to put my time in. Um, it may be a challenge. All right, so maybe we need to work through that one and a half miles. Um, with families and and those that are, I would question if World's End is one and a half miles from a school. I think it's a little farther, <laughs> but um, you know we should look at all those main road crossings and make sure we have it accurate. And you know maybe we massage it of one and a quarter miles, or or just telling parents maybe it's a little safer to drive um, or ride bikes too. Ride bikes as much as possible. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's those major roads would be, I, I, that, you know, 3A and, you know, that's that's a road I'd really be concerned with, you know. And, yeah. and, you know, I know that probably there's not a lot of kids that will be walking, but I think we need to make sure that if they do, do have to walk for some reason that they're able to do that. So. Yeah. Can I just add something, Liza, real quick, if you don't mind, um, just to your question, because I think, you know, I want to be clear with the busing too, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we were to lease buses, we'd have to do it for a minimum of one year. Um, and so we'd own those for a year. Um, and so even if we, there are two risks to that. And, and I want to be really mindful that, that, you know, even if all the money in the world existed out there and you could just still do it, one, you know, should we do that because of the risk? You know, if the governor were to shut us down again and to close the state and the schools, we're going to be we're going to be eating those those buses. We're going to have them, and we're going to own them for a year. The other part of that is hiring the people. And I, I think John is, um, you know, I mean, I, I know he's clearly articulating the difficulty it is to get bus drivers as it is. We have no subs, uh, and so just to be very clear, and and again, none of this. We're, we're not trying to paint a, a difficult picture. We're just trying to paint a clear picture for you um, to let us, you know let you know what we're dealing with. So the, the reality is that we may not be able to find seven drivers. We didn't talk about the seven monitors that we'd really like to have on those buses too, because we don't have monitors on all of our buses now because we can't find them. Um, so that's a real issue. But also if you hire drivers and then we stop going, we have obligation to those drivers too, because they become employees. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is that long-term cost yep. that is just going to be existing that we want to be mindful and, and good stewards of the public's money as well. Yeah. Um, and so again, we just want to be clear about that. I, John, I want to make sure I articulated that correctly. Uh, absolutely, Paul, well, yes. That's clear. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it is a huge challenge, no matter which way we look. So thank you for the clarification. Hey, Carlos, you have your hands up. Just for the benefit of everyone at home, because I know that there is a lot of questions in terms of when uh, phase three would happen. And obviously, we have several variables. Um, is there a way, uh, Dr. Austin or Dr. Lebois or even John, they could sort of try to come up with a timeline of what the, you expect in us as the school committee to do? I mean, especially if we are to, uh, you know, to 
decide on the policy of uh, you know adjusting the, the whether it's the mile or the mile and a half. Uh, and do you need all three items to be implemented in order for this to happen? It's the seven additional buses, the, is, the, is the adjustment on the miles and also uh, the change in the start time or one or the other will take care of that? Eric, you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I, I don't know, John, you want to do that first or? or um, so first I and just foremost, wanted to say one thing, Paul. Just yeah. like you know, clearly tell us if we needed seven buses and seven bus drivers, then the decision needs to be right now. If it's going to early, you know, you know what I mean? Because there's just no, we need, we'll need all of that lead time to try to get uh, available candidates and, and sort of get them trained and, and try to be ready by January 4th. So it's like there's not like hey, we can't wait like a couple of weeks because I don't think we'll be able to accomplish it. He had two holidays in the middle there, too, you know? That's, uh, you know, people aren't going to be looking for jobs during holidays. Uh, and, and I want to add to that real quickly. I know that Don also looked for uh, services that already have drivers in place, uh, and there's no availability of that right now. John, I want to make sure I'm correct with that. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the, every district's scrambling for transportation because everybody's facing the same, you know, reduction in capacity for you know, all the drivers. I mean, even schools that went remote for a student, you know, initially when uh, for a student, a couple of uh, schools went remote and they thought that, um, we thought that the drivers got laid off, but per student held them because they're placed in other places. It's, it's, and Carlos, the other part of your question is we don't need all three. We need one of the three. So we either need seven buses, change start times, or um, uh, change the policy. But we, we don't need all of them, just one of the three, yeah. yeah. But we do need to Thank you. Yeah, we do need to figure out space, transportation, and instructional staff. But we do need those three things to happen in order to execute. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. One, one of the things I would say, and, and the school committee gave me the, um, the authority to change policy during this crisis. Uh, and so you really don't, you don't need to vote on policy, you don't need to change that. Um, but I'd like to get you're kind of thinking on that so so I was prepared tonight around transportation to say my recommendation is um, for us to continue to work those numbers to massage that one and a half and see if we can make that better uh, and continue to look at that versus um, the commitment to go out after seven buses uh, at this time I just don't think that's feasible for us there's a lot of work to be done and I want to be clear we still have to negotiate uh, all these changes um, to the environment uh, and, and that takes time. So, so I, I wanted us to be cautious, but to, to move forward. Um, so my recommendation is for if we need to make policy changes, that's probably our most effective and efficient method first. Although I know it's going to be inconvenient, um, but I'm not seeing any really great ways out of that. Again, I also want to wait till Bessie uh, comes forward with, with their new guidance because I am anticipating some. So I, I wouldn't make a move until they do. What we do need. Um, I would like to have some consensus tonight. Three minutes, okay? What I would like to have is some consensus on space tonight um, because we really do need to move forward uh, with St. Jerome's. Um, we've been uh, in negotiations with them. We're going to continue. Um, but I'd like to get consensus from, from the school committee tonight that that's what you'd like us to, to really continue to move forward. Um, because if we don't solve that space issue, we just simply uh, can't move forward with coming back. Uh, and that becomes our most critical need, and it's going to take time. I know it sounds like a long time between now and January 4th. The reality is there's only about nine weeks to go before we hit the winter break. Um, that doesn't give us a ton of time to, to do some maintenance work, to air technology, uh, and to, to get that ready, as, as well as uh, renegotiating with the association on, on an updated MOA uh, to make that happen. There's just a lot of work now and then. Um, but, so that's what I'm hoping from you tonight, uh, Carlos, at least get some consensus. And, and thank you very much for those answers from all three of you. I think it is imperative for us to be mindful that um, if we are looking into, you know, purpose the seven months and perhaps even more to be
that, uh, you know, let's take the advantage that town meeting is going to be a special town meeting and uh, whatever we need to, to bring this before the vote, you know, the votes um, that, that we have to do at a time because it might be required, right, John, over $300,000? Carlos, could you hear me? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, you did you hear me? Not no. very well. Not, not really. One, two, three. Can you hear me now? You might want to turn off your camera for a minute. Sometimes that makes it easier. Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's better. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Then technology. Anyhow, the question was. Oh, actually, I was. Uh, mentioned to John and, and administration that we need, we need to be mindful that we have a special town meeting coming up and that if we have to look into spend $300,000 or more, that perhaps we can incorporate that into the town meeting. But I'm not sure the deadline to let them know that we have an item. Um, you know, if we are able to vote on this, at the next meeting, by the next meeting, which is November 2nd. So just let's be mindful of that. If, if this is something that we need to bring before voters, that perhaps they can on the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Does anyone else in the committee have comments or questions? Ness? I, I, um, I guess I just want to echo what John was saying about um, transportation and the bus drivers. Uh, and I know Patrick does a great job and I have seen him in the buses in years past because he can't find people to fill in as um, substitutes so I am worried about that um, I don't think we'd be able to find the seven and keep the seven and keep everybody healthy um, so I actually think about the other options one of the questions that I had something that John had presented is um, different start times is that would that just be for the elementary? And it looks like it's only thirty minutes difference. Uh, it would only impact the elementary schools, and I'm going to give you a sense of the actual times. Um, the issue really becomes our late school with kids releasing well after one thirty-ish for lunch. We just felt like that was a little late in the day. Um, to the most time. I'm just trying to find my note for the time. Uh, I'm here, Jamie. If you need. Okay, yeah. Do you remember the, um, the split? It was a 30 minute split, and we had. Um, yeah, we would we would start at about 9.20, 9.25 would be the start time for our day. We start at 8.50 now, and we end at 12.50. So if we were to shift it, we would be ending closer to 1.30, which wouldn't put kids, in, which becomes the issue. We don't have the capacity the space to provide lunch because lunch requires kids to be at least six feet apart, um, masks off to eat. And we have to think work case if we had to do that in January, you know, that would be a challenge. So and that's just to give some context, uh, and these are these are um I guess they're still sort of viable options. You were thoughtful of the impact to our teaching faculty who have made um, family arrangements impact of that school community in terms of parent work schedules. Um, but we've been looking at about a 755 start for PRS, an 820, 825 start for South, 850-ish, 855 for Foster, and 920 to 925 for East. Okay. So yeah, that, like, there, it's definitely a the early times is certainly helpful for elementary school. Everybody's always wanting to get the kids there earlier, but I didn't realize the impact on the back end that they would go that right. way. We did look at moving it up, and it, it, it sounds silly, but we were looking at like 6 a.m. starts, and it's just too much <laughs> to try to get it to an earlier because we do need the, the full capacity of the buses to transport each of the schools. Yeah. I think one of the other things that I would add to that, Ness, is I was concerned if we went full time, what does that mean for a release time, particularly like in East? We're now talking 3.30, that would be a 3.30, right? Uh, Tony, if you went full. Yeah. So you're on mute, Tony. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, likely. I mean, um, at least. Oh, yeah, that would put us pretty late in the day. Yeah, and what I'd be concerned about is obviously transporting students late at night. 
are in the late in the afternoon, particularly with the sun going down very early in the wintertime, would be really problematic. Um, and I also want to, you know, one of the things, we had great great discussion about this, uh, Dr. Lua and I, uh, and the central office team, that we're really mindful that our teachers use child care and, and have some real issues around that, uh, as well as our parents do. Um, and, and the kind of impact that would take would be pretty substantial, I think. Um, that'd be my concern. That's why I didn't recommend it this time. Would, so would changing the start times, that would be, would that be subject to collective bargaining? It would be collective. It would be subject to collective bargaining as well. Okay. Thank you. And then Jen, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes. Um, thanks, Gary. Um, are, are we still just talking transportation or can I ask? <laughs> Uh, not just. Um, no, I had a question for, so for kindergarten, you had said the advancement to five days. Are we just talking half days for that for that grade? We're not talking a full day, but they do okay. have an extended day. They're about four so, a day, which all told is actually more than the half day program was, but they're just not full days because we had to reuse those specialists um, in other ways. So two thirds day. Jen, they're two-thirds. Jen, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that could work with the transportation, but, um, and then the, would that impact the other grades if you did K through two? At the five, five days, would the older grades go to three feet or did it stay at six feet? No, they would stay exactly as they are. And again, the, the idea is that we bring in the grade, in grades and the kids back in sp grade spans and sort of pressure test the protocols, make sure it's working. I mean, the, the, the reality of the drop to the three feet, uh, you know, I, I will credit this, this thought to Mary Eastwood, but, you know, part of the re reason why we've been able to sort of withstand the, inf the, 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 the sort of students who have are COVID positive is because we have the six feet distancing in place. We know that there's been no, when we chop that down to three feet, that potential um, uh, sort of exponentially gets bigger, right? So, so that one student who's now less than three feet, uh, less than six feet, we now may have to take precautions with uh, quarantining or isolating a particular grade or an entire section or a bus or a, does it make sense? So like we've been able to sort of withstand the current numbers because of the, the phase two six feet. As we drop the, the feet distance, um, we do have to uh, uh, sort of advance to a new set of protocols around, because um, you know, if somebody's sitting next to them less than three feet away for more than 15 minutes or three feet away for more than 15 minutes, they're now in close contact, right? And that, that, that exponentially gets bigger for the number of families and kids and teachers actually who might be impacted by potential cases. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We truly have sort of thought of the all of the you know the the um, sort of the, as the variables get solved, the, the new realities that we'll have to face as we make those adjustments. Thank you. So I have a few questions. The first is just kind of a remark, um, Dr. Austin. You had mentioned about we had to be good stewards of the town, the taxpayer dollars. And I agree with that, but I think we shouldn't let that get in the way necessarily of, of making sure that the students get what they need. Um, and, I, and I know you're not doing that, but, and part, part of that is that some of the, I, I mean, I'm in favor of using St. Jerome's. Uh, that's great that that's there um, and it's not too far away. Um, if we can lease it uh, and pay for it up front, that would be eligible for CARES Act funding, um, which would be helpful. And I don't know if it's possible to, if we were to lease the buses, if that would be a possibility to prepay. Um, that's, I think it's something to, to keep in mind, um, with that. Yeah, you, you actually, before you go on, you actually can't do that. You can't, we, we've actually looked at that. You cannot prepay. Um, for for or either, either one, you have to pay for things as they happen. You cannot prepay for something you're going to use after the CARES Act ends on December 31. Okay. And, so and that's just to clarify my other position around the money issue, what I was saying, I, I have no issue about the money. I just want to make sure if we're going to spend it, it does what we need it to do. My concern with spending the money and not have it meet the needs of what we actually have, uh, yeah. and that would not be good for us to do for taxpayers. And that's, that's where I was at. Definitely. Um, John, you did mention that Foster was dropping from, I think, 13 buses to two. Is that keeping in mind the students that would have to be bused over to St. Jerome's if we do it? Uh, no. No. The um, So the... Uh, 
the bus, it, it would drop to, if you took the Rock Hounds for one and a half miles, Terry, then it would drop to two. Mm -hmm. So St. Jerome's isn't really figured in here right now. Um, so we, we would have, um, you know, we, we could figure that out once we get to know what students are actually going to go over there. Sure. You know, we'd have a couple buses available. I mean, because we're looking at the combination of buses between East and Foster. So there's still a few extra buses available that could, you know, because it could run okay. the fleet of 22. Oh. <laughs> okay. So. And then the other question I had is, um, so if we were to make that policy change and move it from a, a mile to 1.5 miles, do you have any sense of how many students would be impacted by that? Um, yeah, Cal, um, um, Patrick put a chart together. So um, <clears throat> there's a, you know, for example, like, it, and it, it's showing the uh, the number of walkers and the number of riders. Like, for example, <clears throat> TRS school, there's like four, 243 eligible for a bus. If you brought it down to 150, 1.5, it becomes 208. Okay. All right. So that there's a there's a hundred some odd kids. If you uh, went to Foster School, there's 319. If you brought it down to 1.5, there's 41. Okay. But we'd still want to hit some more on the other side because you have a lot. Like uh, you know, you'd say you have a lot in the neighborhood there. You get a lot in the shipyard. So uh, those ones that, and, and then you have people um, uh, around the center of town, which would be you know some of those. Those would be within the 1.5. They'd be sort of walking down to the intersection, and, and the crossing yard would get them across the end. So they walk down facts, they walk down Lincoln, and it, they'd meet there and they'd get across um, there. Um, when you look at South School, there's a, a 338. At 1.5, it goes down to 155. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, and then he's got it down for by equipment. So right now, um, South School and PRS go together. So that's eight buses and, four, and six buses, mm -hmm. right? So it's 14. Now we have 22 available to us. Okay. Um, you know, so, you know, we can, if there's, there's some, there's some room to work with that. The tightest one would be the Foster and the E School, especially when we want to hit Baker Hill and Butler Road and we want to hit um, anybody that's on the other side of 3A there over in the World's End section, you know, because mm -hmm. then East has two crossing guards, so, um, you know, that can uh, provide those sidewalks that can get the kids um, safe to the school. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, I, do you, I, I, was, I think I know the answer to this, but what what's the likelihood you think that we could actually find seven bus drivers and get them trained? Um, it, we would be, we'd have to be sort of very, very aggressive and try to do it. I, you know, it's not, it's formidable. I, I don't know what else to say. That's why if, if we started now, we could see, you know, um, you know, I'd love to say absolutely by January 4th, I got seven new bus drivers up and trained. But I, I, you know, I have my doubts on that. Um, and then, then I worry about, I, I really worry that, you know, these same bus drivers, they do all the different tiers, right? So, you know, including athletic tiers and all this other stuff. I really worry about if someone has COVID on a bus, that this bus driver gets quarantined. Mm -hmm. And then I worry that that bus driver that gets quarantined actually had interactions with people mm -hmm. in the bus depot and that they end up getting quarantined too, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> we don't have those kind of stuff. We just don't have those kind of subs. So that could change really, really quickly. And that's why I kind of mentioned here, it's like, you know, I hadn't thought about it until um, all of Dr. Austin and I had a conversation on Friday and he called me about an event. And I'm like, what about my bus driver? You know, it's like, it, it really, it really scared me. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a real risk. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Liza, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, just quickly, can when these kids come back January fourth, they're coming back full day or on. So that's correct. Yep. So nine to three or whatever, eight thirty to two thirty, and at three foot distance. Correct. Okay, because I, I don't know. I thought I heard maybe a different 
scenario of that. So, oh, okay. Yeah, the only thing that, that was... the only thing that can't I'm sorry to interrupt, Michelle. The, the only thing okay. that can't drop is lunch. So lunch has to be at six feet. That can't be that even if even if we advance to three in the classroom, lunch cannot advance. Lunch has to be at six. Right. So, but uh, I guess it was Tony was saying that East the scenario was nine twenty five to one thirty because they don't have the capacity for lunch at six feet apart. Correct. So, so where is that falling into this? That's where I'm getting confused. The the lunch the lunch dilemma. Yeah. Like, how will we ever be able to do full time if we can't do lunch? Right? Is that your question? Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what I'm wondering too. We're we're taking over. So I mean, I don't. I'll let the principals jump in here to because each building is a little different in terms of their setup and structure. Uh, but we'll be having to take over other spaces. So gymnasiums and we're we're taking over other spaces to make it work. It's not going to happen in the cafeteria alone. So then if we okay. move the t start times, then the east schedule would be starting at 925 and getting out at 330, not 130. If it's full for time. K for K to 2, but, the, but the, the, the 3 to 5 is still in hybrid. They're still in the reduced day and the partial weeks. So the... the we can handle K to 2. The, okay. the bigger challenge comes when we talk K to 5. Now we, talk, now we get a bigger problem. So, you know okay. I mean? so K to two would be coming back full day, or kindergarten would be their partial day, and then one and two would be full day. Days. Three to five would be the hybrid day, shorter schedule. Correct. And then, you sure you have enough buses for that? Yeah, then how do we do it? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, I know. It's really, yeah. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's a, it's a logistical issue. Where, yeah. but, but we have the, we can do that. Patrick can do yeah. that. You know, I, I mean, we've talked about that. Dr. Patrick over and over. It's like, he, he could do that, you know, in that, in that um, mode there. So. Okay. All right. Then that, that's where I was getting confused. Yeah. So thank you. Michelle, are you? <laughs> I was. No, thank you. I was. I was with you on the confusion there, Liza. Um, because I was like, how the heck are you going to get all those buses? But if they're Patrick gonna says keep, it's going to work, gonna, I'm going to believe. Well, they're going to keep going, Michelle. Right. So I mean, a bus driver typically I used to do six hours, but they're just going to be, be running. You know what I mean? It's like okay, yes. you go going from here, you go going to there. So we used to have our you know breaks in the middle and stuff, and, and it's those breaks that are going to be now. There's actually going to be a run there. Okay. You know, oh, that so, makes sense. Um, you know, because like if you get the 130 at least, but before that it might be a Plymouth River, it might be you know Plymouth River and South, and then it's going to be Foster. Um, you know, so you're you're just cycling. You're like dropping everybody off, and almost right after you start dropping everybody off, you're picking up maybe middle school, getting them home, and then right after that you're going back to the elementary to cycle. And then after you do that first level of elementary, you're doing a second elementary to get the full day kids back home. Okay, so right. So exactly. the entire transportation department will understand what it's like to be a mom and hang on the weekends. <laughs> drive, <laughs> drop one off, take another one off. <laughs> well, we fortunately, if they like to drive. They're great people. Um, you know, it's just not going to we keep them healthy and they all stay strong. You know, because yeah. uh, it's it's it is a weak link. I mean, when you look at it, Transport Canada, we, we we're fortunate to run our own transportation system, but it's a it's a weak link. You know. If, if something goes wrong. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one other question. If we did the, the option where we're changing the start times of the school, what does that do to the kids who are in the Metco program? It, we, we're going to have to sort out transportation at least for the late run. So it, it really doesn't impact anybody. It, the, 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 it's the later time that would impact, particularly at East, that we would have the biggest impact. So we would either... I think what I, my, my recollection, John, when we processed Metco, um, we talked a little bit about potentially having to get a van or a separate transport for the our students at the late school. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that you know we'd have to figure out. See, we wouldn't want all the kids waiting for you know that last school to break out because that would 
you know, put them into the fix. So maybe you would have a van available, get a van. And it's a east with, um, I'm not sure how many kids we have here, but, um, you know, we'd probably be able to transport them in the van. So. Michelle? Sorry, thanks. Um, sorry, uh, off the topic of transportation, um, I did have just one question on the St. Jerome's. Is that pretty turnkey or is there some relatively significant work that needs to be done at that building to move it, move over there? I'm just wondering, does that impact the time framing at all? Not so much from a financial standpoint, um, you know, because I know that, you know, in conversations with, you know, individual people on the town side, you know, they are very supportive of the schools and understand what we're trying to do here, um, you know, from the Board of Selectmen to advisory, that they know that, you know, the priority is to educate the students. So I'm just thinking of it more from a timing perspective. Is it pretty turnkey or it will take some time to refurbish? So I think that the answer to that question, Michelle, is it's, it's, it's the, the building's in very good shape. Okay, so I mean, it's not like a, it's not like a building that we have to do a bunch of repairs and stuff. I think that the time we're looking at has to do with the time to actually procure it, to enter into a lease, to to get some some of their equipment moved out, to have them do a little bit of painting, which they sort of volunteered that they they would do. You know, remove some things, although they don't want to remove everything because they don't can't afford pods to have the stuff put out there. Um, for you know us to figure out a way that we're going to maintain it because we can't do it with our staff, you know, send a, a company in there to give it a really good scrub down and cleaning and stuff. And then most of it has furniture, whether we have to like move some of our furniture in there, which we have to look at that. And um, then the, uh, um, what's the other, then the technology. So the technology is big. So I, you know, I, I'm trying to get in there next Wednesday so I can have Joe take a look and say, okay, Dream up. How are we going to get this place connected? You know what I mean. So there's 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 all sorts of things. It's great space. They got brand new windows. They've got beautiful. Uh, they they got a recently uh, you know within the past seven years I think the boiler's been done. Um, you know it's a, it's good sizable rooms, and um, you know it could be. And there's good. There's a good number of spaces too. There's you know at least the nine good sized classrooms and then a bunch of work uh, breakout spaces too probably another four or five you know um, they got a big gym there's a there's a lot of good stuff in that facility uh, but so we're looking at the, you, know, you gotta look at the timeline how long will realistically all that take you know i'd love to say it'd be done next week but you know everybody's doing stuff there's no staff to do it i mean this is the way we have to move forward and, and try to procure everything so that's great. That's compelling. Thank you. Thank you. So I see a number of hands raised. Um, so what it, my thought is that we can hear from uh, the uh, the audience people and then um, kind of see if we can come to a consensus as a committee on how we want to move forward with this. Um, so the first one is Eileen Bevins. If you could state your name and address for the record. Hi, Eileen Bevins, 8 Plymouth River Road. Um, I'm not sure if this is too off topic, but I kind of thought that maybe we would hear something about um, moving to more of a full, fuller schedule for high school. Is that something that's not going to be talked about tonight? Sorry, I don't move you know, on that. At this time, uh, we are not considering um, moving high school and middle school, uh, we really are focused on our elementary level. Uh, so no, we're not prepared to talk about that tonight. And and frankly, we're also watching uh, the cases very uh, closely in, in the older population. Uh, and so our focus is, is uh, squarely on uh, K2 uh, and 3-5 tonight. Okay, I just have one more um, just question on that. It, it seems like the high school does not have some of the same issues that the elementary school has. So I'm not sure that why, why that's not um, more of a priority. Transportation is not an issue. I think spacing is, is less of an issue. Um, so that's just a comment. Um, and then regarding the buses for elementary school, way to require a uh, I'm sure if you ask parents, they would do anything to get their kids back in school um, a little bit more. And is there a way to 
ask them to sign a waiver is that they're not going to take the bus and that we don't need to provide um, the transportation for those people who sign a waiver. And maybe that's a, you know, that's one of the requirements that you were talking about from DESE that's going to be loosened, but that's, I, I would imagine the parents would be willing to do something like that. Yeah, we, we expect we'll, we will actually have to uh, start surveying um, and that'll make a difference on who we actually transport and when we survey on the parents. Uh, they've been incredible. Uh, all the parents have been incredible right now in, in transporting. Uh, and so I would anticipate, yes, I agree with you, uh, Eileen, that I think that people would do just about anything to get the, the student back in with the earliest uh, educators, uh, education uh, programs we have. Uh, so we will be surveying people and we'll be uh, certainly looking at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Uh, next is Jen Murphy. Hi. Sorry, I had to take my, to take my camera off. Um, thank you. And uh, first of all, I just want to give, uh, sorry, could you just, sorry, could you just say your name? And oh, sorry. Ben Murphy, 29 Bradley Hill Road. Um, I just want to give uh, a shout out of gratitude to the teachers at Foster. I have a child there and our teachers doing an amazing job, as well as the entire Foster community. So um, thank you. I think all the teachers are really stepping up in this situation, which is not easy. Um, my questions were actually, I had the same question that Irene just asked around a waiver, because I know for a fact that I know a number of people would be happy to sign a waiver saying that they do not require busing. And I know we had talked about that over the summer. Um, so I had that question as well. And then my other question was around um, the phase three. Um, it feels like a long road to get from where we are now to where we want to be in that January timeframe. Is there an incremental phase that we can uh, that we can explore, like a 3A, to get the kids just to stay for their two days of, room, of um, in person learning that they're already in, and they could stay through lunch? I understand the six feet, but could they eat in their classroom? And has that I know that was discussed again over the summer, but is that something that we're still looking at, or is it that they have to be in the cafeteria? Right now, so, yeah. Right now, we are um, wanting to, to keep them in the cafeteria. The amount of cleaning that would have to be done from an unmasked lunch in a classroom is really um, there's logistical stuff. I, I know it sounds like a, a simple road, but the the reality of the variables that we have to solve to make that happen. And I I can certainly turn it over to the principals who know the intricacies of their buildings better than I. Uh, but my understanding is we are not looking at having them eat in their in their rooms at this point. Uh, we're trying to keep contain them with their masks off um, in one location where that can be cleaned. Um, but I still can refer to others. But right now, that's we're not looking. That's just not um, something we're discussing. I can also speak to Foster. Just at Foster School, we have some classrooms where we have students who um, they we actually only have um, half of the desks in the space in the classroom space, so that we and we are. Um, cleaning the desks halfway through. And so there's uh, there, the classroom spaces are, while they're six feet apart, all the students are just looking at um, the full day. It just makes it challenging the way that we have um, some of the spaces set up, even though they are six feet apart. I can also speak to you know, all the schools. Like most of us are using the cafeterias as instructional spaces at this point. So, um, you know, to add lunch to any particular grade level would require us to change quite a bit of scheduling around. So, not impossible, but there's a lot of those car hurdles in the way to, to get any lunch. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I just want to add um, that, you know, to get the lunch done, you wouldn't gain as much as you think with a full day because right now they're getting a solid four hours and they go home and do their specialist. And then there's a little bit of time left in the day. So, um, you know, again, everybody gave all the reasons, but we want to really think about the fact that they're getting that solid four hours, which a lot of teachers have said is great. They're getting a lot done. And then, of course, they do more when they go home. And, and I just want to, I do understand that and appreciate that. I just, I think the social and emotional connection oh. of being in person is something that we need to be prioritizing as a community and trying to get them 
in person. So I understand all the logistics. Um, I think there are a number of parents who would be happy to volunteer and help if, that, if you know if it became an issue of just having bodies. Um, it sounds like it's it's more than that, but um, you know I just encourage you guys to continue to think out of the box and do you know all the things that you've been doing, reaching out to community members to get ideas because I think everyone is just seeing how successful we've been over the last few weeks of having the kids in person and how excited they are. We all are just so hungry to give them a little bit more, even if we can't achieve, you know, the phase three that we've articulated in the previous slides. We are too. We're very concerned about the social emotional as well. Definitely. Thank you. Right. And I will say, you know, just it, it, on behalf of the entire district team, no idea has been dismissed. So that any suggestion that we're not thinking as critically as we can or as thoughtfully as we can or as sort of exploring every potential option. I mean, it, it, we hear that a lot, and it's just, I want to be really clear that, that this team has not stopped on this planning since uh, since last March. Right. No, I, I, I just want to be really transparent about that. Yeah. No, I understand. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, next is Hallie Grace. If you could unmute yourself and give your name and address. Hi, uh, so I'm Hallie Grace. I live at 20 Franklin Rogers Road. I'm a parent of a seventh grader, a sixth grader at middle school, and a fourth grader at Plymouth River School. Um, so I spent, you know, a few nights this week on curriculum nights, and uh, pretty much every teacher, um, my fourth grade teacher at PRS plus my middle school teachers have said how significantly behind our children are right now and where they need to be in learning. Um, and that's just like, that's very disconcerting to me um, that we're, you know, only a month in and we're pretty far behind. So we're spending a lot of time catching up on the curriculum from what they missed last year, plus what they're supposed to be, you know, trying to achieve this year. So, you know, only addressing K through two, maybe starting in January, um, not really getting to the middle school and high school seems pretty unfair to the kids given that there's only been four, you know, four cases in the elementary school, five cases in the middle school, and five in, five cases in the high school. So um, I guess I would want to know like why, you know, we're not moving forward in terms of getting kids in and getting them up to speed where they need to be. Um, secondly, in terms of transportation, I don't know if there's been any sort of kind of ridership surveys you know my daughter who goes to the fourth grade she gets on a bus with maybe seven people um there's nobody else on the bus she gets to prs in a matter of five minutes and sits in the roundabout for about 20 until she gets allowed in school so you know i don't know kind of the disconnect between how many kids are actually riding the bus maybe this goes back to a previous comment before but it, it there does seem to be a disconnect of how many people are actually riding buses versus getting their kids to school. I drive my middle school, you know, kids to school on their two core days. There's a line up Main Street all the way backed up to, you know, South School to the middle school at that time of day, but everyone is willing to do it to get their kids to school. So it just seems kind of like an excuse um, to not get our kids to school when we could actually do some surveys to see how many kids you know, how many parents would be willing to drive their kids to give the people that need the opportunity to take the buses to get to school. Um, and then thirdly, I just would want to ask, have we actually put out those job offerings to the marketplace in terms of hiring bus drivers? Um, you know, our unemployment rate is very high right now. I'm sure there's plenty of qualified drivers that could be, you know, trained, um, Corey approved, whatever. I, I, have we even actually explored hiring those people at this? if we had to go that route. Um, it just seems like the buses are completely underutilized at this point, you know, given my experience. But so I'll leave it at that. Okay, uh, thank you. D Dr. Austin, do you want to take that? No, I, I I wanted to make sure that, I mean, you, you had multiple questions in there, Alec. I, I, I apologize for that. I think, you know, I'm going to talk just specifically. Somebody said there wasn't a space issue at the high school and middle school. That's actually not true. Um, we, we still have high numbers. There are many classes, particularly at the high school, that would be well overfilled um, if we uh, came back even at three feet. Um, and there is a lot of concerns. As the older students, as we know, 
um, there is a lot of concerns about what would happen if we brought them back at three feet. Um, right now, I have worked with the Board of Health in Hingham, um, and, and the recommendation for the Board of Health is let's focus on the young students um, because right now we really believe that that transmission is very, very low. We see that in the numbers. Um, and, and so um, we've really chosen to focus on K2 and, and 3-5 um, right now. It doesn't mean that we're not going to change either. It doesn't mean that we're not going to consider middle school and high school, um, but we have to do one thing at a time. Uh, and so that was the recommendation of the Board of Health is that let's keep going just where we're going. You know, we really like where we are. We're staying healthy. Um, we don't want to risk not being healthy, particularly at a time when we're just not sure. This is an incredibly unstable environment, as we all know, um, with 800 cases a day or whatever we end up having in the Commonwealth, and we're starting to increase. We don't want to set ourselves up for failure either. Uh, so there's some concern with that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not going to cons consider at a later time thinking about uh, middle school and high school uh, and moving them into or full time. Um, so I'll, and the rest of that, that's, so that's just one of them. I think on the the, um, the marketplace, um, I mean, there was a lot of, could we put those things out? Yes, um, we could. But I would also say, and John knows more about that than I do because he hires the, the drivers with Patrick, um, we're having a really difficult time just getting subbed now of qualified drivers looking for time. We can't find them. Um, so, John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. that no, that's it. that's it. I mean, you know, we, we constantly have ads up there for about, you know, and, and typically we're saying, you know, it's always a bus driver sub, but just about any sub that comes in and is willing to get trained, you <coughs> around long enough, you're going to get a job. Um, and when I say long enough, Haley, I'm talking, you know, if they, lots of times when the subs come in because we have such a big fleet, fleet we're having them drive just about every day. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like a teacher sub. You may be, you know, getting called once in a while and stuff. These people are constantly, you know, on buses as subs. And then, needless to say, um, bus drivers tend to be sometimes, you know, you get more of the senior population because it's an excellent job because it always has to be a part-time type job. So, you know, eventually they say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire now. And then that's when the new subs come in. And, and there is a big fleet, right? So 25 buses, we have 20, at least 25 bus drivers some subs and then we have van drivers too so they could there's um you know van maybe 10 11 van drivers so we're looking at about 37 people there's constantly flow in there and if you were a sub you could they can drive a big yellow bus you can also drive a van so it's not like any subs we wouldn't get work and they wouldn't get work constant time and the sub rate isn't that significantly much lower than what the regular rate is so I don't think that there's anything um, there that would sway people from saying, hey, I want to be a bus driver. Um, so they are very difficult yeah. to get. And, and then you talked a little bit about the, you know, the bus counts. And we do do bus counts. Right now, we've only been back three weeks or so. You know, I mean, we have to, we have to do a couple of things going on this year. One is we will do bus counts when we think we get the volumes that are going to be the regular volumes. I would expect and I would hope that parents get more comfortable after a while and say, yeah, I'm going to throw my kid on the bus now. Because the buses, the bus routes are set up so that, you know, we have so many kids, like those 25 kids per bus. And then, you know, if you're saying four or seven or eight, you know, choose to ride the bus, <clears throat> that's because the parents don't choose to put their kid on the bus right then and there. So we will. I mean, and, and once the schedule's hard, we get a bit of feel for the counts as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just, I, I find it really unfair that our children are so penalized in terms of what they're allowed to do, yet I can go out to dinner with 10 of my friends, and I can ride a bus and take an airplane and, you know, take a ferry into work. It, it just seems really penalizing right now for our kids that can't have the most simplest, basic form of transportation and the ability to eat lunch you know, in a pretty safe manner, it just seems pretty crazy to me. But I'll, I'll move on to the next person. Haley, we're all hurting about that same thing yeah. ourselves. We, I mean, literally hurting. You know, yeah. this is killing us. No, I know it is. And that's what it's, it's really unfortunate that these are the things that are holding up our kids that our teachers have already told us that our kids are far behind where they need to be. So anyways, thank you so much. And our teachers are doing great. Like, I again, I applaud you all it's not easy so thank you so much thank you Ellie. Yeah, thank you uh emily field hey, 
Good evening, it's Emily Beal for Ackward Lane. Um, thank you for all of your efforts during this unprecedented time. I have two questions. The first is, could you share what's taking place on Wednesdays that's preventing our kids from receiving live instruction? And then the second is, along the lines of lunch, is there any opportunity to explore using our safe and beautiful outdoor spaces surrounding all of our schools for meals, snacks, PE, et cetera, to increase the opportunity for the full day instruction? Jamie, you want to talk about Wednesday or the principals can meet either one? Yeah, um, Emily, do, when you talk about Wednesday, do you mean in-person instruction? Yes. Um, so that is the day that, the, that we're using to actually do a deep clean between the two cohorts of kids. Um, so the buildings are being sanitized and cleaned, um, which is uh, right now sort of standing in the way of the kids returning. We are looking at... Um, adjusting that as the phases roll out, but we, we at this point, and I'll defer to the principals who, who know better uh, what's happening uh, relative to the cleaning, but um, in the design of the plan, that was to actually clean between the cohorts. So we have cohort A on Monday, Tuesday, cohort B through the, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday was the clean between the two groups. So a deep clean is taking 24 hours. It's not, but it's it's taking more, it, it, there's a work day in which our employees work and that work has to get done within the work day. Right. And could deep cleaning happen in the evenings when kids aren't in school to open up the opportunity for Wednesday instruction in the for half day? It, yes, and I believe I, I just, we are working on that right now. I, I will defer to the principals relative to sort of the, the, the time we're actually seeing it play out. We're only three weeks in, and so we're using this time to figure out whether, again, all of the initial planning uh, variables were uh, were sort of put out there to say as we get into doing this work and figure out what we need, what we don't need, we'll make adjustments as we go. Um, and so that is one of the things we're discussing, uh, particularly with the elementary team relative to in-person instruction uh, happening more frequently. Um, but the, the volume at the secondary level makes that more challenging. Uh, so I'll pause there to see if the elementary team has any thoughts there. Um, but it's not that's not being discussed. It is being discussed. Um, it's just that we're not ready to announce a change in that just yet. Anyone? Or did I, I might have just captured it all. You did. You captured it too. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry, Emily, what was your, you had another question though. That was another one. Just wondering if the outdoor spaces, you know, we live in a very safe town, beautiful yeah. campuses, if they could be utilized for snacks or if even like we keep saying like these lunch, the, the lunch opportunity with six feet apart, like kids are eating snacks in their rooms and I understand the cleaning concept. So could we shift some of these snacks or meals outside to increase the opportunity for kids to be, get more live instruction? That, in, that that actually is occurring. Yeah. It is that it's the kids are right now eating their snack outdoors. Yeah. They're getting mass break outdoors as much as possible. Um, we have this frequent discussion. We talk about sustainability. You know, whatever plan we put into place needs to be sustainable for the entire school year. So we need to be able to provide lunch in an equal space when January comes. So that's what we're thoughtful about making sure that whatever plan we have in place for kids to eat needs to be sustainable for the entire year for all kids. And I just wonder with the opportunity right now, with the weather being as beautiful as it is, it's too bad we couldn't take advantage of these great, wonderful days right now where I know January, February, March, we're going to have inclement weather that we'll have to adjust. Um, but we are, I, they are having their snacks outside. Right. I, I'm also just trying to think about lunch, too, because they keep saying the six feet and, and that that's the issue and trying to use the classroom space or, and you know, I understand everyone's looking at this. It's just that it's just something that kind of came up. That I was thinking about. Yeah, and I think Emily, if I can just add to that, I know that as we've said, we have one cohort that A B is in all day, and, and so we do have students. For example, at Foster, they use the uh, I want to say is it the shed. I want to make sure I get it right uh, at Foster. Um, it's a shed. Yes. Yeah, so at, at Foster, uh, we I like to refer to it as the outdoor cafeteria calf, no, but um, outdoor cafe. <laughs> But we are using the outdoor area. It is covered. However, um, for example, on days that it rains, such as last, um, I believe it was last Tuesday and last Friday, we needed to make alternative arrangements because then it's not weather tight. And so it does rain on the inside of that. And so we're adjusting on days such as when it rains. Um, and then we're making different plans for students to eat lunch safely inside. And so currently at Foster, the students would be eating inside uh, in shifts in the gymnasium um, because in the 
cafeteria as well as the presentation room at Foster, we have classrooms that are taking place in those areas. But we are using outdoor space for our lunches um, on days such as today when it was beautiful out so that students can eat outside. I also want to add to that, um, I, I poured, you know, I, I'm fairly regularly in the buildings and, you know, you, you see outdoor classroom space being used all the time. I mean, you see teachers outside reading to students, um, doing lessons outside, and I think that happens across the district. Uh, fairly regularly, and, and we need to take advantage of this time now. I also want to be clear, I, I think, you know, the, these are all the things that you just brought up, Emily, is exactly what we've been talking about and trying to find solutions that are long term. Um, and it's really appreciated hearing the, the feedback. And um, as John said earlier, we're all feeling it. Um, we want this to get better, and we want to bring our students in. Um, we want to do it safely, and we want to be successful. Uh, and there's no, no rocks or no recommendations that are being overlooked. That's right. Well, I appreciate the um, everything you guys are doing and the, and the responses to this. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Uh, next is Sarah Ross. Uh, Sarah Ross, 125 Robert Tech Road. Um, I have a follow-up question to the middle school and high school questions that have been asked um, this evening. So. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, better help us understand in the timeline that you mentioned of the nine weeks for trying to figure out K through two uh, on that January 4th date for phase three. I guess one along that timeline, you guys will begin to um, talk about getting middle school and high school back to a phase three and would that also be that around that January 4th date, or are we looking at later than January 4th? We are looking at later than January 4th. The, the secondary level presents uh, additional variables of their own. So while we still have space issues that present themselves there in terms of class sizes and the, the, the amount of kids in a section, we also would have to completely revamp their entire master schedules for both middle school and high school. Um, that would also, we would also in, in that need to, um, we still have yet to solve, so, so just to sort of be clear that the, the DESE restrictions um, have been, have still not been um, uh, adjusted for all of our specialist areas, right? So our physical education, our music, our instrumental music, singing, chorus, uh, so they're still having to occur remotely because of the, the distancing. It, it, 10 feet, I believe, um, is what they're telling us now for music. Um, we, can, we can sort of have them in, but now we need to find a space with uh, a 10 feet of social distancing. So while the, there, there, there could be a reasonable path forward relative to the core, the five core areas, areas have still not been resolved. So, uh, you know, I, I think that as we think about secondary as its own um, it sort of uh, as their own level with their own variables that, that we have not, our, the central office's role right now has been on prioritizing our youngest learners who are most at risk. Um, if we, we have a small window, for example, to teach kids how to read and we can't lose that window. So I'm not, we're, I'm not at all suggesting that the other grade levels are not a priority, um, but in terms of the, the internal capacity we have as your administrators to actually do this work, we're really focusing on K-2 as a coordinated effort among the entire central office team, meeting once or twice a week with the elementary team to sort of problem solve all of these work, this work with them. Once we have a reasonable plan outlined and we have, no, we have space, no, we have transportation, no, we have the instructional staff at K-5, to then we'll turn our attention to the secondary level because we will have to coordinate when those, that transition happens because it simultaneously will have to roll out new master schedules uh, at 6 to 12, which will require a, a lot of planning um, to sort of execute that. So again, not excuses, but just being real with you, Sarah, around sort of where we are in our planning and what is to come for the secondary before we can begin to have those conversations more concretely. Okay, um, so that's helpful. Thank you. I guess I have a follow-up question to that. So I guess, is there an alternate um, schedule? And, and I totally understand that, again, like you said, since March, you guys have looking, been exhausting alternate schedules. Um, and again, totally appreciate all the work that everyone has done um, through this crazy time. I guess my follow-up question would be, is there some kind of alternate schedule for middle school and high school 
as a phase three something uh, that could be looked at to get the kids in school more days per week, but perhaps say at their current schedule. So that, like you said, things like chorus and, and uh, drama or what have you maybe are still happening uh, after school, if you will, quote unquote, or after in person, but maybe they can get into school more than two days a week. Um, again, going back to the social emotional that another parent had uh, communicated earlier on in discussion, as well as I just think that the, particularly at the high school, um, I'm cognizant of perhaps the students and the teachers really not making connections yet this year. And if you're talking about the potential of students, particularly at the high school level, you know, really only seeing their teachers once a week in person, and that's not going to happen until after five months worth of school, so half of the school year. I'm just trying to figure out if there is an alternate solution, particularly at the high school level, that students and teachers can engage with one another more than one day a week. Um, and again, as you're looking at, at, at that um, group, again, if there's another alternate solution that maybe could be looked at that is not quite exactly phase three currently as planned, but some kind of alternate phase three for that level. Uh, um, the the schedule. I mean, the the, the schedule would revert back to the, the the past schedule, right? But what where where I'm what, where the issues come up though is with the class sizes and the space. So again, we do have some sections at the secondary level, given current enrollment, that if we go, that that they don't even fit at three feet, we would actually have to go lower than three feet, right? So so the. The, there is a tangible issue that we can, the, the dilemma on the space issue, um, which, you know, as Dr. Austin mentioned, we have been wrestling with for six months. I mean, the, the, since the, the, the planning began to return, we knew once we did analysis of class capacity that the kids don't fit in the classrooms, right? Like that's why we had to go to a hybrid reopening um, at the six feet, because even at the three feet distancing at the secondary, we still are not fitting um, all of our class sections. So not only would it have to be Sarah, a sort of a rollout of a new schedule, but then a, an adjustment and reshuffling of all of the class sections to make sure that the kids fit as best they can, or um, finding alternatives to the space issues at the secondary level. Um, the elementary, it's exacerbated by the foster space issue. So that's where um, St. Jerome's provides a reasonable path forward to problem solve that space issue. Um, at the secondary level, those variables are less straightforward and really depend on the time of day. Um, we, if we go back to the old schedule, what we, what we have not done is sort of figure out a way, to your point, of how to maintain those specialists, uh, the, you know, the, the gym, uh, physical education rather, and music and instrumental and chorus and orchestra. Um, we have, we, if they went back to the traditional schedule, those would then fall at all points throughout the day, which then complicates the return to that schedule. But they have not yet begun working on sort of an in-between schedule because we're also thoughtful of the impact that schedule changes have on faculty and kids and um, school communities. So um, it's not that the discussions aren't ongoing, it's that we're not at a point we're ready to publicly talk about sort of the plan for the secondary because we're still working through um, all of their individual uh, issues. Okay, sorry. And then if I was not clear, I guess what I'm asking is from a schedule perspective, if basically the high school could use the phase two schedule, because that, that would not change, but if there's a way to get the kids into school uh, more than two days a week. And so I just wanted to clarify yeah, it's the that space. statement. And I understand the space right. part. So if you're still saying there's still space constraints, hopefully, like you said, when Desi comes out with potential new guidelines, maybe there's something that, like you said, is less than three feet right. that would allow the, a, a non-space issue that then gets looked at and discussed. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that point um, to knock off some of the variables so that we have less variables to deal with. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Sarah, I'll just add for that real quick, Sarah. I don't think there's anything that, that off the table. I, mean, I think Jamie had said that earlier that all those considerations be on the table and we're all, um, we all want the same thing. We all want to have our students back um, and, 
and make that happen. Um, and we're all working towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now, um, I still see a number of hands raised. The last question we're going to take is Ted Grace. Um, but next we have Lucas. If you could just state your full name and address for the record. Sure. Lori Lucas, 18 Harvest Lane. Um, I just wanted to go back and ask a couple questions about, you spoke about in the plan um, about there being outdoor space. And I know you touched a little bit on it on Emily's, um, when Emily brought up the question, but it hasn't really been fully answered, I don't believe, about there being space for outdoor snack and mass breaks. And you touched upon it in your plan for the next phase, but also how is that being met for this phase? I'm going to let the, I, I think it's best at the, uh, I, are you looking at the elementary level, I would assume? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll let the elementary um, principals talk about that question. So currently we have a schedule set up for outdoor snack breaks um, so that students are eating their snack outdoors. And then we have also have a schedule set up for outdoor, what we call brain breaks, so students are going outside um, as well. At Foster School, we do have students eating outside as much as possible for lunch. We do have them using the outside um, area, and the tables are set up, and we have chairs outside. So unless it's raining, we have had our children outside who remain at school um, to have lunch. They have been eating outside every day, um, again, unless it's raining. So we do try to get our students out as much as possible um, for their snacks. Um, they're always eating outside as much as possible. And then they also have the mass breaks or brain breaks outside. I should clarify, I do understand that it's happening for um, like weather when it's fine, but when it's not great, what is the plan? Because I'm not sure that's, um, being transparent to everyone. I'll speak on behalf of the principals in that, Lori. When, it, when there's inclement weather, there is no plan. Right? We, we don't have another solution for outdoor spaces when the weather is inclement, to be fair and transparent. right? There, 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 it, it, there's not, we don't have another viable solution of where to put the kids uh, during inclement weather. That's fair. Okay, so that's going to be thought about and planned for since it's part of the next phase. It was mentioned in your plan for the next phase. As planning, yes, that's correct. Okay, and then my other question was, you talked about remote teachers, and is that going to be an option then for current staff um, that were denied remote teaching um, requests? So the, the positions for which people had previously applied did not exist at the time. Effective tomorrow, we, the district will post for remote teachers in grades K through five, and any eligible internal uh, candidate is eligible to apply for those positions. Okay, so those will be posted internally? Correct, they will not be posted externally until we do an internal run to see who, um, who we have that applies. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Next we have Kirsten Moore. Uh, Kirsten Moore, 120 South Pleasant Street. So first off, I'd like to say that um, I'm at East, and um, uh, the teachers we have dealt with have been absolutely fabulous and above and beyond. And we couldn't be more grateful and thankful for all the work that they've been putting in, and we know how hard it has been. Um, my questions with regards to one, which won't necessarily apply to me, but just to the kids in general. You were talking about uh, moving busing from a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half out um, for elementary schools. Is, was that correct? We had talked about if, if we needed to um, transport that many students. The, the current policy is one mile. Actually, it's not one and a quarter, it's one mile. And saying in order for us to be able to transport the number of students that we have to transport, um, we'd have to possibly move that to one and a half months. Right. My uh, concern is while this town does have many beautiful miles of sidewalks, there are many streets that have no sidewalks, blind curves, and blind hills. 
in that are these elementary children that are now close enough within this, are they going to be responsible for, for walking on these? Or will there be exemptions made for those streets that don't have the sidewalks that other kids do? That's my first one. But my um, other concern, and I'm sorry, I, I had to miss the first 20 minutes, was with regards to um, where we're talking about moving um, start times. And I'm curious, so East is now up for a 925 start. And is this- No, I don't mean to interrupt Kristen, but that was one of the variables we discussed that right now, uh, that's sort of the, 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 we're not really entertaining the adjustment of start times unless we can't resolve the, the transportation issue through additional buses or through a, a change to policy. Because of that, there's lots of problem, there's a lot of dilemmas, I should say a problem, there's a lot of dilemmas when we push the start time back, particularly for the late school. Um, and so that would be the, the sort of the least ideal, um, the least sort of a reasonable approach. So I, I don't want that to be any misunderstanding that we're proposing a new start time for East because that's not accurate. Okay, so that's off the table then? It's not, well, what we, what the presentation tonight was to the committee and the community was to sort of give um, sort of visual representation of all the discussions that have been happening and all the things that have been discussed. So one of the things we did discuss to, uh, to solve the transportation issue was adjusting start times, but there's two other options in terms of the additional buses or the, um, oh, I'm forgetting my own. Uh, three things. It's the addition of the, the policy change to one hundred oh, miles. Correct. The policy change to reduce to, to increase the distance that we have to transport for kids that need transport. So that so while the start times were discussed, it's not unless the committee sort of decides to go in that direction. That's not what the administration is recommending for a path forward to resolve the transportation issue. And yeah, Dr. Ross, I'm going to speak. So feel free to. We will be discussing that after we get all of the community comments. Well, my concern is if you are intent on discussing this. So if there is now going to be a 925 start time for this, one, the sun sets at 422 in January, which means the kids now coming out of the school, it's going to take time to get home. They are going to have less than half an hour before it's dark. So that is a severe disadvantage to these kids. Second, what about all those working parents? For you don't get to choose which school you're at. As it is, we have one of the latest start times in the town, which I don't think anyone at that school is outwardly a fan of. Kristen, and I, think you, it, I agree that, sorry to interrupt, Kristen, but I know you missed that first 20 minutes. That's exactly the, the argument that I made of why I wouldn't recommend that, um, that change. The, the late ending up, the, the time that it would take not for school, how early it gets dark, and two, the change to the, to the schedules for most, not just the families, but also the teachers as well that come on child care, et cetera. I do want to go back and answer the other question uh, that you had was, did we consider with the 1.5 uh, the danger at street intersections? And Don Ferris did address that earlier. We do know there's some intersections, and we're not going to... It's not a matter of intersections. Questions. It's a matter of a complete lack of sidewalks. I, I, I hear you. There, there's no... Our job today, Kristen, I, and I'm sorry, yeah, but sure. the job today was to tell you all of the issues that we're facing you know, trying to figure out um, a way to get into full-time school. What we've come up with is no great solution anywhere um, to some of these problems. There is no waiver. People have talked today about a waiver of transportation. I completely there are legalities with regards to busing. I completely understand that. I don't have a problem with that. You guys are in an absolute pinch with regards to that. And until Desi does something, there's, you're, you're in between a rock and a hard place. I will absolutely never give you guys a hard time about that. And I think it's unfair for those who frankly who do. However, um, this is something that you're still, you're, it's not off the table with regards to the start time. And until you say it is off the table, then I do have another question. So sorry, 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 Pearson, sorry to interrupt, but, um, but the three minutes that you have are over. Well, if you need to follow up with... interrupt me with regards to that, and that wasn't my question. My most important question was, if there is a 925 start time, and these third through fifth graders do not get a full day, how does that change their end time? 
as it is they're being held until one o'clock without lunch. Does that mean their time gets extended or does their day get shorter? The time would be extended to past 1.30, which is what we, we discussed a little earlier, how that is not ideal, particularly for East Elementary. So it would be extended to 1.30 and they still wouldn't have lunch. Correct. Which is, again, Kristen, the there's no argument that that's not ideal, which is, I didn't mean to interrupt it. That's, I wanted to give a context that while that was a variable that was discussed, adjusting start times, it is not one that anyone in the administration is comfortable with uh, proceeding with for, for all these reasons. You're absolutely right. We have this exact same concerns. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Patricia Wolfe. Um, yeah, hi, Tricia Wanty, 180 Downer Avenue, uh, um, and I'm both a um, employee at Foster School and I have a junior at the high school, and I had two questions. Um, the first is you mentioned the cost of busing um, or adding the buses and, and bus drivers at $300,000, and I wonder if you've put a cost yet to the additional teachers, paras, and support staff it would be needed as well as what the lease for St. Jerome's would cost and where that, which budget that would come from is my first question. Um, my second question has to do with whether there's any avenue to work with the sports teams in towns, excuse me, um, especially as it relates to if we move everybody into, or if we go to that three foot distancing, and how quarantining is affected by anybody who might have a positive test. It seems some of the things that we can't control, like eating out and parties and things like that, I know we have no um, control over, but maybe there's some things that we can't control, like sports teams in town. Those are my questions. Can you, what was the question around the sports Do we team? Have like, any the avenue to work with the te local teams to limit what they're doing because it's affecting, it may not be affecting our schools right now because we have that six foot distancing with the quarantining. So we're able to, where there might be community positivity, it's not necessarily spreading within our schools. But if we go to that three foot distancing, that's a different animal altogether. And it seems like with the sports teams being a source right now, I can see that having a greater impact at later. And is there any avenue that we can work with the sports teams in town? I, I, I want to clarify, you're asking about youth teams and other leagues besides Hingham Public Sports, our own school sports, or you're talking about the outside leagues? Well, I mean, I know that Hingham Public Sports is limited to the older groups, right. um, school, school wise, and so to whatever it, it extent, I, I guess that's what I'm asking. Do we have an extent? and um, any further extent to community teams that are specific to Hingham, but maybe not. Yeah, that, that's one of the questions that we've asked the Board of Health and we work with the Board of Health on. Um, I have that same concern um, and how that impacts our, our programs. Um, absolutely. And so I will continue to work with the Board of Health on that. Um, so we don't. The answer is we don't. Well, no, I don't have any control over it, no, but I can right. probably talk about that. So, and that is something we've discussed. Um, the second part of your question on, have we thought about the other monies? Absolutely, um, we, we've thought about those monies uh, and, and where they come from. Some of them are going to come from uh, the COVID relief funds. Uh, in fact, most of them would, um, to, to where that would come from. So um, that's what we're hoping to have is the reimbursement from that uh, as we move forward. And do we have numbers for those? Like we had the figure of 300,000 for the buses, but I, I, I it sounds, Sounds like the other expenses would be even greater than that. I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any solid numbers for that tonight. That's one of the things that we'll do um, a little later because I just don't have those numbers as far as okay. exactly. Thank you, Patricia. It's, 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 a, it's a high number, Patricia. So, I mean, needless to say, if you know, 300,000 of buses and you're talking about five people, uh, you know, plus a pair of the remote teachers and you're talking about renting a place, I mean, you know, it's, it's going to be a sizable number. So, you know, it's a, you have to know what the plan is before you can kind of come up and figure out what the number is and who the people are taking, um, you know, those remote positions. So, you know, take it from 300 and bring, bring it up to a million, somewhere around there, you know what I mean? Between those, well, those I, two I do. prices, exactly. between no, two prices is where it's going to come out. 
Well, exactly, which is why I'm asking, like, how can we, how well, are we going to afford it? <laughs> well, no, yeah, I mean, you know, we've had um, other reports here where we've provided, uh, you know, this, this storm that's out there, right? I mean, this is Mother Nature at its best right out there, boom. You know, nobody sees it because it looks like it's invisible, but it's just a hurricane that keeps on going on and on and on. So, um, you know, yeah, the, your questions are as good as mine, and some of them will be reimbursable and some of them won't. Certainly, you know, from what we're learning now, anything um, post-December 30th, 2020, won't be reimbursable, you know, unless they do something extension, some type of extension, or if some other type of aid comes to town. So, you know, it's a difficult problem. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Julie Donovan. Thanks. Thanks for taking my uh, my call, my um, comments. So I have to share. I guess I'll just direct this question at Dr. Austin. I, I'm not. I'm not understanding why we're not um, working in parallel to get the high school and I'll say middle school students into class full time, even after January fourth. That what? Like, why the slow roll? Like, I, I know this is hard. This this group, and quite frankly, even the parents on this call, are the reasons we're on is because we care so much. But this is actually, this is our jobs. Like, uh, like we're failing our kids right now. And to, know, to be here on October 19th and here, there's no plan to bring the high school students back in January, I have to say is kind of blowing my mind. So... Um, if there, I'm not looking for one more answer because I know there isn't one, but why are we not bringing the high school students and the middle school students back in January? Because even if, and I've said this multiple times, Julie, multiple times, even at three feet, the kids do not fit into the high school program, even at three feet. It doesn't work everywhere. We've said that all along. That has never changed. I cannot continue to repeat enough to say I can't create space at the high school to take away all of that issue when it comes to this. This is miserable. There's nobody who wants anything more, believe me, than for us to be back and bring them all in and say, here we go. I can't create the space. I, I don't have the capacity. I don't. I can't ma wear a magic wand. I can't do it. And so what I'm telling you is the exact same thing that I told you six weeks ago and, and probably three months ago is that the space for three foot, even at three feet, there is not enough room. I'm understanding. So it's not about that we're not trying or thinking about how to get the high school. It's, it's one, where we can which is exactly what we said last uh, a couple weeks ago, because the numbers are down K-1, we can then begin to say, okay, then what space do we have that we can try to utilize for our youngest grades? But the fact is the high school has higher numbers this year than they had a year ago. We actually are increased, like I said in the last enrollment, actually have more numbers than we've had in the past. At the elementary level, particularly K-1, we don't. And so, it, but... But what we're mindful of, and even when we talked about that tonight, even when we go to three feet, if all of a sudden those people that have used pods, et cetera, stop in January and say, well, if the, if the school is going to go back to three feet and they're going to go full time, I, I have a pretty good feeling that they're going to want to come back. And as soon as that happens, we're going to have, we got to be mindful of that. And so we're planning for that. And that's why we've got the St. Jerome's issue. I don't if have. You seem, sorry to cut you off, Dr. Austin. Since the high school doesn't have any same issues, and I understand the three feet, and I understand that's a Desi rule, so it's a waterfall effect. It, it just blows my mind that we're on October 19th. We're just there's no plan for the high school students. They're, they don't require buses. We are cleaning the schools full time on Wednesday. That we are doing. We are letting. We're failing our children, which is it, just blowing my mind, and. We're just, we're, if we're using the, the um, challenge of this is really hard to not 
did you know they did get a person running for these older children? It's like, I mean, I could start to brainstorm. I know there's too much talent on this call, so I won't, um, I won't be, I won't even attempt to do that. But I'm leaving this call thinking we've got the younger kids solved. Thank God they're so cute and they need to learn how to read. So I'm all for that. But to not have a, a, a defined plan in place to bring the older students back for more in classroom learning is, I'm sorry, we are not doing our jobs. We're just not. And I'll, I'll put myself in that category as a parent. I am letting my kids down. And to me, that's not acceptable. Okay, thank you, uh, Julie. Heather Henderson? And this will be the last um, comment. All right, I'm here. Um, so just a, just a couple of things. Um, so something that I've struggled with as a parent and somebody who works in the community as well as somebody who was on the committee in the summer, it's something I've, I've really struggled with is the fact that the big committee just sort of, of petered out. It just sort of went away. And I'm, I'm wondering sort of why that is, first of all. Um, there was no sort of, we're not meeting anymore, we're done, thanks, <laughs> anything. It was just sort of like, we're not meeting anymore and it's done. Um, so there's that. Um, and there could be a million reasons why, and, and I understand that. Um, it was a really big and unwieldy committee to begin with, and I'm suspecting that that's part of it. Um, so that's my question number one. Number two, it's, um, I, there's still a lot of miscommunication and misinformation, and I really think that part of what, when we started that committee, one thing that I think that definitely we could have all done better is with communication around what is going on, what is happening, what are you guys working on? Because one of the things that I really struggled with over the summer and worked really hard at was telling everyone that I came into contact with what you all were working on, how much work you were putting in, how hard you were working on, what specifically you were working on. You know, like this committee's working on this and these people are working on that and these are the things they're working into, you know, and because people had the perception that nothing was being done or that you weren't working on this or you hadn't thought of that yet. And I was able to tell them, no, they are. And then it was really helpful because there were also emails going out with updates that you guys had worked on all these things. And all of that communication, I feel like, has stopped. There's no more communication about we're looking into this option or we're looking into that option. So I think maybe we need some more communication. As a parent, I would appreciate that. Additionally, I think maybe it would behoove you to come up with a list of frequently asked questions. Why can't we go in person? Oh, because Desi has set these regulations for us. We're stuck. Our hands are tied. We can't do that. If you guys find yourself answering the same question ad nauseum, have somebody write it up. And then maybe you don't have to send the same email back. Yeah. It's, uh, sorry, I actually just announced at the beginning of the meeting that we were putting um, what, several weeks and multiple people Great. in the administration. Okay. I missed that. Fabulous. Okay. Good. Because, you know, people don't know, and they're asking the same questions over and over and over again. And so this might have also been something that I missed because there was a lot going on. But what specifically needs to happen between now and January to get our youngest back to school. Because I know that you keep saying that it's been only three weeks, but it's actually been five weeks, and it's actually been seven months. So why can't our list go back to school in person? Because they are not doing anything at home. Happening from now in January, that's gonna enable them to go back to school. Well, I, I, you know, I, Heather, I'm sorry. I, I, on behalf of our faculty and our administrators, I, I cannot accept to hear that our youngest kids are just not doing anything. So I, I apologize. I disagree with that sentiment. I hear you. Okay, I, I talk to you. Your, your feedback is appreciated, and I hear you. I just I don't, okay, but, I don't agree. But hold on, Jamie. I talk to a lot of people in the community. I'm a therapist in the community. I speak with families, parents of kindergartners who are desperate because they are trying to work, 
and their children are yelling at the teacher. They're not doing anything. They're not learning. I, you, are, you are welcome to that opinion. I just disagree. So I, okay. to answer your question, uh, we need to I can figure out a transportation, uh, a resolution to the transportation issue, and we need to execute a contract and prepare the building at St. Jerome's to uh, absorb the overflow space. Yeah. And that is what is taking time. I think there's, um, there's actually a, a couple of additions to that is I also have to, to renegotiate in, uh, the MOA. I also have to do with start times and working conditions. That's going to take a little time as well. I don't think that's an impediment. We have to just do that work. That's required of us of law. So that's going to take a little time to do as well. Um, and so that is that is something we will be doing. I've already asked for dates um, from the association, and, and so they're aware of that. Um, so we can begin that work and, and get moving on this um, in, in a way. I also want to address, you said I never had a meeting. We did have a, a follow-up meeting um, that I did thank everyone who attended all those uh, meetings during the summer. We did talk a little bit at that meeting. I don't know if you were there or not. Were you? I was. Okay. And, yeah. and part of it was, yeah, it was a very over, it was, it was a, a wieldy um you know, group of folks. Um, it was, yeah, it was big. It's a big group, uh, probably a bit off more than we could chew. And as I said, next pandemic, which I hope never happens to any of us, uh, that we, we we kind of address some of those issues that we could have done better this time, or I could do better in, in managing them. But the reality it came down to we needed to do some work um, within the within the, the district itself uh, and get things moving in a reality for all of us. In regards to the communication, we did shift to the, to the schools. Um, and, and you're right, I mean, we can do more. It's not a matter of we don't want to do communications, but then I hear that people are overwhelmed with too much information. Um, and it's kind of, I, I think, you know, to all of you, you know, I'm trying to find that space in the middle um, that says, okay, you want this, you don't get enough. It's kind of like the same thing when we talk about, um, you know, live teaching. You know, some people say we want the screen time, some people say, no, too much screen time. And people are always trying to adjust, and I'm trying to adjust as well, Heather. You know, we want to give well, information, and we want to move as right. far. But the last piece I want to say, we agree 100%. There's nobody who doesn't agree that getting our youngest children, or at least yes, that's that's K-2, true. into school as quickly as possible. That is our commitment right now. That's what we have the capacity to do, and we will continue to work on that. Um, at a time, and, and I will say, you know, look, this is risky because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen with Z. We're just really committed to that, and we're full steam ahead, working on all the pieces, working with our unions, working with our teachers, working with the, all the other pieces to make that happen. So I want to be yeah, very sure. clear that that's our commitment. We hear you. I have young grandchildren myself, and I've said that. I'm watching no, them and have to do the same thing that you're talking about. I'm very aware of it. Um, we're everyone, they are hurting. The parent teachers are hurt. Everyone's mm -hmm. And, you know, we're trying to finish that right now. And um, it's, it's, it's not about hard work. We've all been working hard, right? I don't want to know. We're no. working hard. And we're trying to, we're trying to reach every domino that we hit. Every domino we take now takes another five. I know, minutes. I know. And Dr. Austin, that's that's what I want to get back to. And when I said when I said that the meetings had ended, and you know, and there there wasn't a meeting. And when I said you know there was no ending and no thank, you, I didn't mean to say like I needed thanks for being on the committee. One of the things that I really appreciated was being able to tell my neighbor and tell my friends, oh, I know they're really working on that. And I told everybody everything that you guys were doing. And I think I, it helped me to be able to know and to be able to tell people. And now I just feel like. And it, the, generally, the sentiment in the community is it feels like um, like there's there's no forward movement, but there has to be forward movement. We know that you guys are working, but it doesn't feel like that when it doesn't seem like anything is moving. Do you I know do, what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, and I appreciate the feedback, and it fit, and it's not going to help, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> you know, I talk to my colleagues as Jamie does, the assistant superintendents all over the Commonwealth. Every district is facing the same exact thing. Right. right. You know, I, I talk to the superintendents and they say, for the love of God, Paul, would you stop doing this? Because uh, I don't hear enough from the parents that I've got to do. Why can't you do it if right. Pingham does it? And everybody's right. feeling the same thing. I think there's just a huge wave of frustration for everyone right now. We can't yeah. recreate no, what school is, right? And so yeah. how do we, this is where we have to come together. We, we get 
common right that we want our students to care of our students, we want to take care of our community. We get that. We're all part of that. Yeah, and there's nothing absolutely. that any of us want to do, and that's where we have to come now and understand that we're all trying to do the exact same thing. It's true. We are moving forward. We are moving forward. It's just a lot slower and more free than any of us did. No, to that, 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 that end, if sorry, you guys sorry. need help with PR, I'm willing to do that. <laughs> sorry. But like, I'll type, I'll help type if you want to help with typing. No, thank you very much, Heather, for your feedback and your offer to help. Um, we're lucky to have so many people that are willing to. Um, if we didn't get to your question tonight. I see a couple of hands that are still came up after we um, drew a line. Um, we're all reachable on email, so please reach out, and um, we're happy to talk um, or on the phone or anything like that. Um, Hi. No? Sorry. Thanks, Carrie. Just two things following up on that. Um, there's two coffees coming up also with Dr. Austin. You're welcome, Dr. Austin. Uh, <laughs> but for the Thank community, <laughs> it's exactly things like this, though. So that's sort of the, the point of those. Um, and then... Um, I wanted to just say, because I've just been sort of looking at some faces on the screen, and, um, you know, it's, and, and sorry, I'm just going to soapbox for a moment, but it's, it's so hard for the professional educators and administrators and the volunteers on this call when we hear the frustration and, um, and the disappointment that parents have, but I just want people to be mindful about using words like failing children and not doing your jobs because there isn't anybody in this administration or in the buildings who do not spend more time thinking and worrying and caring and teaching your children. And I know it's not meant to come across as, you know, you're not trying to deflate people, but I'm looking at the faces and it's breaking my heart because I can see that there's so many people on this call and this Zoom meeting who are doing everything they can to move forward. And the kids are moving forward. And it may not look the same as it did in the past, but it is happening. And is it as fast as it usually would be? Maybe not. Maybe it is. But the whole world is going through this. It's not just seeing them. It is the entire world is going through this. So I just want to remind people, and I mean, people were very respectful, but just you know, be mindful of the words and remember that there isn't anybody on this call who doesn't care about the kids. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so we had we had a couple of options that were presented a couple hours ago now at this point. Um, so one was uh, say whether we should go ahead with the plan for St. Jerome's and then the other was were the three options for transportation. So I'm gonna ask the committee, do you have any thoughts on these? Where are people's heads? I have some thoughts. <laughs> 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 but there is still in my head. No, I mean, I'm sort of ready, I think, to sort of move on here and get some votes or whatever we need to do. But sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think we, I don't think we need to vote, but we need consensus tonight. So, yeah. um, Liza, you have your Yeah, um, I would like to move ahead with St. Jerome's. I think we're going to be in this COVID 19 situation for a long time. I, I, from the comments I've heard tonight, I do want to remind people that tonight on the news, Massachusetts hit 827 COVID cases. It's the highest since May 24th, a 4.68% positivity rate. And the last time we were above 4% was June um, 3rd through 6th. This isn't going away. Um, and we are fortunate that we still have plans to move ahead with our schools and to pay attention to our youngest learners and that our high school and middle school students are learning. They're doing much better than they were in the spring. And so we need to stay focused. And I think St. Jerome's will be a big um, problem to solve or solve the problem of our elementaries who really do need more attention. Um, and I think we should pursue the policy on the transportation um, and nuance, uh, nuance, and nuance, nuance of the transportation to address that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Liza. Uh, I, uh, sorry. I agree. So, sorry. Go ahead. Me? 
Sorry. Um, I think I would um, agree with what I said. I, 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 yeah, I think I think St. Jerome's makes all the sense in the world. Um, and I think it also helps, you know, if we kind of solve that problem, it's a trickle down theory, right? After we solve that problem, we can move on to other, um, other issues facing the district. And I agree. I think the change in the policy is the smartest, um, most efficient use of the transportation. Um, you know, I think we'll have to do some nuancing with, you know, sidewalks, streets, things like that, but I think we can get there. Full faith and confidence in Patrick. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? Well, I, I would just say I agree on both of those. Um, but I guess the one thing I would ask is if we can work with families that this is a, a hardship for, if they were in that 1.5 miles and we're counting on transportation. I um, if to support the idea. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, now you're not going to. But I'm just going to, Carlos, if you don't mind, I'll just finish up and then you can um, go. But I just uh, no, I agree. Um, if we could just if we could just plan to work with families though, um, because this is our parents have been wonderful with helping with with everything that was needed, and um, I think we should support them if, if they need the extra transportation. Carlos, do you want to unmute yourself? And... I am not sure what's going on with my internet today. Uh, Rita has no meeting at the same time, so I guess the time of hanging is taking over my technology here. Um, I support us, uh, uh, you know, moving forward with St. Jerome and also looking at the policy, you know, changing the policy. And I know this is not something that's going to be permanent. This is just something that uh, we remedy uh, the situation right now. So um, go for it. Okay. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Ness, Jen, or Libby? I um, good agreement. Um, yeah, I think we move forward with St. Jerome and um, talk about the transportation change in policy. Great. Thanks, Jen. I agree. And um, moving forward with St. Jerome's. And I just, um, just quickly on the transportation, I just, um, similar to what you said, Carrie, about working with families. And I just, I'm uh, uh, nervous about the, the the busy streets with crossing Main Street and 3A, and I just hope we can um, work together with those families um, to prevent um, those children from having to cross the street. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Libby, do you have anything? Uh, no, no, I agree. Okay. Yep, it's all good. Yep. All right, thank you. So does that get you what you need, Dr. Austin? I think that's fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. everyone and appreciate all the comments tonight. Yeah, and thank you for all your responses. Um, okay, 4.2 is... Uh, <laughs> tell me, I think. Yep. <laughs> I can't wait. Not as much controversy, I think, on the next one. Um, um, just a couple things. Uh, just a reminder, folks, there's no school on 11-3, which is election day. Um, so they've asked us to close that day. So uh, there'll be no school. Schools will be closed on 11-3. Um, there is a special town meeting request. Uh, which is going to happen on 1121. The idea is that it's going to happen on the multi-purpose field outside, if at all possible, uh, with a rain date uh, uh, the next day inside. Um, and I'm hoping they can hold that outside just like all of you. Uh, so, so that's happening on 1121, uh, which is coming up faster than we could imagine. Uh, and then finally, just a quick note about school lunch program we did hear from the national lunch program uh we will be able to continue our free year and i would encourage people to take advantage of that uh, our food are an amazing job of, of uh, picking up meals and uh getting them ready for students um and please take advantage of that uh whether that's in person or or not uh, um you know and remote and, and going home with those meals so please take advantage of that if you can. Um, so I, I think that's all the things that I have under 4.23 and 4. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, communications 5.1. That's you. Yeah. Uh, it's still on me. Um, sorry. Communications um, I received, obviously, in regards to the in-person learning. Um, 
I, I want people to know that I've heard you, I've listened, uh, we're doing our very best in the school system. Uh, and I, I echo what uh, Michelle uh, Ayer had said, that, that people are working uh, every, every square inch of this district. People are working very hard and they care deeply about your students. Uh, and so I want to mention that and I appreciate those, those we all want to get there and, and we're going to do the very best we can to get there. Um, so we'll continue that. Uh, I also wanted to address some of the many, many con uh, positive communications I've received about our new website. Uh, I don't know if we've done this before, uh, if we've really mentioned it before, but Dr. Lugula had that, had that up for us and got that changed with the communication subcommittee, or not communication, but community outreach. Um, and the new website is is fantastic. Um, I've received a lot of positive feedback, and, and Dr. Lugula, I just want to recognize your work on that with the committee and getting that done uh, in, a, in a very difficult uh, remote time uh, to get that up and running. So I wanted to mention that. Um, so thank you for that. Great. Yeah, no, I agree. It looks great. <laughs> so thank you for that. We work on that. Um, five point two, okay. Five, you get a break now. 5.2 is student communication. And we are very pleased to introduce our new student uh, liaison to the school committee, uh, Carly Kennedy. Carly is a high school student at Hingham High, and we're very excited to have her. Uh, Carly, your segment will not normally be this late, I promise. <laughs> so, so if you could just give us an update on the start of school. Hi, everyone. My name is Carly Kennedy, and I'm a senior at the high school this year. Um, so I first just wanted to talk about remote learning. Um, and I think from the student perspective, it's been going pretty well, a lot smoother than I thought it would go, um, especially the days where some kids are in the school and some kids are at home. I think the teachers have done a great job at including everyone and calling on people both at home and at school. Um, and in some ways, it feels like we're still all together. Um, and then also teachers have done a great job at accommodating after school help at 2.15 um, because obviously it's hard to do one-on-one -on -one, um, work this year, but um, teachers have been great at being willing to work with their students after school hours. Um, and then it's definitely hard to be outside of school, but the days that we are in school, I think are effective and everyone's very focused and happy to be there. So um, I think that's awesome. And two struggles that we've had, um, Definitely group work. We've, it's been really hard to work with our classmates, especially when we're in person because everyone has their masks on and we're six feet apart, so it's hard to hear each other. But um, when we are on Zoom and we get to go into breakout rooms, it's great to be able to talk with our classmates. Um, and then another issue that I've heard from my peers is regarding testing because um, obviously it's hard for the teachers to be giving tests this year, but um, there are days when some students are in the classroom and some students are at home. and um, it's a testing day, so I think I've heard from a lot of my classmates about the unfair advantages of that and how some kids are in the comfort of their own home taking the test while others are um, in school. And then um, on another note, the drama club right now is working on a Zoom play um, that they're performing from each individual actor's home, which is awesome because they're still involved and they're still doing what they love. But um, even though it's not on stage altogether. And similarly, the um, orchestra, band, and choruses are all practicing rehearsing on Zoom um, and they mute themselves and perform individually. So they're really been able to um, practice their individual skills. Um, the green team, um, they can't really do any hands-on activities um, during this time um, throughout the community. So they've been really focusing on having guest speakers educate the club and just learning more about the environment. Um, and then student council, um, they're struggling to find ways to fundraise um, and do community service this year, but we're definitely brainstorming all the different possibilities. Um, and this year we're raising money for the Anna Quinlevin funds. Um, and we're thinking of doing spirit weeks and just trying to do different things to um, include participation and make people involved um, despite the circumstances. And we did just have student elections. So other than the senior class, um, we have new officers in every grade, which is very exciting. Um, and then sports, I think, you can see from our records that um, the masks aren't really stopping us and we're still having great seasons um, and definitely took some getting used to, but um, despite the masks, I think that we're doing a good job. It's definitely hard to um, not have team bonding this year, but um, I think everyone's been doing well and the sports have been awesome. 
So thank you for listening. That's great, Carly. And thank you so much. It's really great to hear from the students' perspective um, how things are going because this is a brand new way of doing things. So, so thank you very much. Um, okay, so next we have um, 5.3 other communications. Does anyone else on the committee have? Michelle? Thanks. I do have something um, relatively quick because I think it's something to take up next year, but I had gotten some communications and then I actually looked on our school calendar and I noticed this. So it is around um, Columbus Day and whether or not you continue referring, celebrating the Columbus Day holiday or considering a change to Indigenous Persons Day. Um, and I did notice on the school calendar that it was interesting. Um, Foster School does list it as Indigenous Persons Day. Um, the middle school high school and PRS listed as Columbus Day and then East and South just had it as holiday. So I was thinking that um, I had gotten some communications around considering um, if the committee would consider changing the holiday next year. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for put in our minds that um, that might be something to consider and then plus to get the consistency amongst all the schools to um, call it the same, recognize the same holiday. Great. Thank you. Um, sure. So number six, uh, 6.1 is to review policy section E support services and act as appropriate. This is our second read. Um, so we had read, we had our first read of both sections E and F on July 27th and then hit pause to focus on reopening school. Um, so as with the other sections we've been reviewing with this, this, the assistance of our Massachusetts Association of School Committees field director, we reviewed the MASC sample policy alongside the Hingham Public School tools policies to ensure that we have everything we need to meet our legal requirements and also to reflect best practices in the district. Uh, Dr. Austin and Susan DeMont participated in these discussions and Dr. Austin solicited input from the administrators overseeing the various departments. Um, Section E covers business operations of the school department, including facilities, buildings, and grounds, with the goal of maintaining a positive and safe learning environment for our students and staff. Uh, policies include emergency closings, building and grounds management, and safety, transportation, and food services. Um, these policies are for the long term, meaning post-COVID. For now, um, the, our interim COVID policies that we passed last summer will govern um, any of those areas until the governor lifts, lifts the state of emergency. So I just wanted to see if there are any questions from the committee about Section E. Okay, let's see. Uh, Harry, Harry, hang on. So um, I just wanted to ask, or at least um, say that I, if they're approved as they are, great, but I would like to have the ability to place a comma or, or fix something grammatically incorrect at some point without necessarily having to go through committee approval all yeah. over again, because... Yeah, no, let me just... If as we've done in the past, anything that doesn't change the substance, we can go back and yeah. we are, yeah, and, and okay, MASC will hold that. I mean, I, up to, yeah, up, yep, no, thank you. I'm lucky to have you on the committee to do all that because you're going <laughs> to talent for it. So, okay, so, um, okay, so if there are no other questions, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve policy section E support services. Um, do we have to approve it as pro forma or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll make a motion to uh, approve it in, as pro forma, the policy section E support services. Um, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just to note for everybody on the call, um, what we're doing is one so we have all of this approved and we will adopt them and refund the ones that are in place right now. Um, so do we have a second? I'll second Libby. Um, and we'll do roll call, Michelle. I'm sorry. Aye. Aye. <laughs> no? Aye. Uh, Libby? Aye. Oh, sorry, Carlos? Aye. Uh, Liza? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So it is approved pro forma. Okay, the next one is section F. Um, that covers um, facilities, um, development goals, retirement of facilities, naming new facilities, and, and memorials. And we d currently don't have any corresponding policy, so these would all be additions. 
Um, so does anyone have any questions on this one? Uh, Carrie, I would like to note on the naming of facilities, we do incorporate the town naming bylaw into the policy so that it's consistent. We did not recreate any rights for the school committee. Right. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you, Liza. Um, do we have a motion? It, may, I, may I just ask a question? Sure. So to, to that point, uh, when um, the town is looking into the, um, the fields and, and so on and so forth, and perhaps uh, naming you know some of the buildings and, and things like that, uh, would that be considered also if we can sort of like you know name the field and 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 get a fee for it and stuff like that? Uh, let me, Carlos, if the um, right now the town has to change the town naming bylaw for that to happen. So if I would make the recommendation that if the town changes the town naming bylaw, the school committee should consider changing or updating own naming policy. Right. Yeah. And facilities. Because the policy you are proposing um, gives the school committee authority to name subsections of existing structures or facilities, so classrooms, auditoriums, and gymnasiums would be included in that. I'm not sure about fields, um, though that seems like it would be, yeah, it's, it's a facility too, so that would include fields as well. Thank you. Okay, does, does, sorry, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, um, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve and pro forma the policy section F facilities development. Thank I'll you. Second. Thanks, Libby. And roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Ness. Aye. Carlos. Aye. Libby. Aye. Liza. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you, everyone. All right. New business. Um, so 7.1 is to discuss a memorandum of agreement with the Hinkham Cafeteria Managers and Food Service Technicians for a successor contract for the 2020-2021 year and act as appropriate. Is Mary Power on the call? She was here. Oh, hi, Mary. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good job. <laughs> Sorry, it's so late. Okay, so I will take a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement with the Hingham Cafeteria Managers and Food Service Technicians for a one-year successor contract for the 2020 to 2021 school year um, as presented. Thank you, Liza. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Michelle. So, uh, Mary, um, how, do, uh, how does this work for you? Do, do you just vote with us? or Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so we will do a, a roll call. Oh, sorry, is there any discussion? Can I, can I just share that um, we had a three-year agreement with the food service workers and cafeteria managers, and we asked them if they would be willing to do a one-year agreement just to um, change wages by 2% increase, and that we will then go into full negotiations with them for a three-year contract next year. Um, this is just to give us time to make sure they got their um, cost of living adjustment um, and give us a little break on timing because of all the COVID-19 planning we have going on. So, and they have approved this already too. Great, thank you, Liza. Uh, okay, so we can do roll call. We will do Michelle. Hi. Jen? Aye. Nets? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Uh, Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. Uh, Mary? Aye. And I'm an I as well. So the, the agreement is approved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for hearing it in there, Mary. <laughs> so. Yes. Oh, just before, um, just before I sign off, if, if I may, um, I've actually been on the call for the last two hours and I've I've heard a lot of the discussion and I appreciate really all the different messages that that have come through for this and I would say that both uh, as as the parent pardon the dogs as the um, the parent of someone who's enrolled in the Hingham Public Schools 
But moreover, in my capacity as a member of the board of selectmen, I've seen firsthand over the last seven months the considerable time and effort that um, town and school administration has put into getting us where we are today. And I, I think sometimes, unless you're kind of in the midst of it, it's, it's hard to have an understanding of how hard it is sometimes to kind of move this big ship that we call home. Um, we're balancing not just the day-to-day -day things that pop up, which are considerable right now, but also trying to think ahead, um, thinking ahead to what we do in January, thinking ahead longer term. And um, I, as both a parent and a leader in this town, I don't think we would be as far along as we are right now without the dedication of, in particular, school administration and the principals and all the staff. And I, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to all, to all of you. I also appreciate that, um, that you've been listening and responding to the concerns that have been raised tonight. I think we all have a shared goal of moving through this in a way that's as least disruptive for our student learners as possible. And um, I'm just really glad that, um, you know, Dr. Austin, you and, and your team and all the principals, um, as, as a parent, um, I'm glad you're, you and your team are at the helm of this because I think in these unprecedented times where there are often no good decisions, you're going to make the best decisions. Um, we have some hard things ahead of ourselves. They won't be ideal, um, but again, I, I, uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you for your work and thank you for what I know will be your continued efforts to um, de deal with everything as we move forward. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Very well stated. Okay, so the next is um, 7.2, to consider proposed Massachusetts Associations of School Committee resolutions and act as appropriate. Um, this is to consider um, a set of resolutions that the MASC Board of Directors proposed, and we are deciding to, tonight, or if we want to carry over to the next meeting, I guess we can, uh, whether we are going to support that. It's not that we're adopting these resolutions for ourselves, but that we are we are um, allowing Carlos, who is our, kind enough to serve as our delegate, to go and, um, and advocate for them and vote for them at the MASC convention on November 7th. So, Carlos, if you could take us through. Yeah, so... Um Again, I had sent this to everyone right after our last meeting, and I had asked that uh, if you could please uh, do some reading on your own and be prepared to discuss this tonight. Uh, this is also part of the package. I hope you had an opportunity to look at it. A uh, couple of the resolutions we actually already voted on them. I believe uh, number two and number three we have already approved in the past. So those two, we don't even have to you know, spend too much time there if you if you are in agreement with them. Uh, so let's do one at a time, um, and then if you decide after we do some discussion that you want to table uh, to the next meeting, that would be fine too, um, because our next meeting happens to be on November 2nd, and uh, the conference is November 7th. So we have plenty of time. So let's do a few and see how that goes. Um, is that okay? Okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. All right, so number one is pretty simple. I am going to read just the, the, uh, the title, uh, the first uh, whereas, and then I go right to the idea four, be resolved. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so the first one, resolution number one is uh, the Massachusetts Association, the committee, so, uh, the Massachusetts Association, uh, uh, Jesus, I, I cannot even this. <laughs> All right, let's start again. This has to do with MCAS and high-stake testing, okay? Whereas the Massachusetts Association of School Committee membership and the Massachusetts Association uh, Committee uh, Board of Direct have previously, uh, previously and repeatedly taken the position of opposing high-stake testing, including MCAS. So essentially they are calling for a moratorium for the next three years um, on all tests. And, uh, and also, they wanted to make sure, let me read this as it is, right? So therefore be resolved 
that the Massachusetts Association of School Committee rejects the call for the students of the 2022 who missed the 10th grade MCAS that be required to make it up during the 20, uh, 20, 2021 school year or ever. Furthermore, we demand that those students be held harmless uh, for, the, for not taking the MCAS and that the graduation requirement shall be uh, determined by the locally controlled voices of the school committee and the school administration within the remaining graduation requirements of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So, so it's that and also uh, the moratorium of the next three years. Mm -hmm. Is there any question on this one? I think the moratorium, it looks like it's just for the 2020 so, so yeah, that would, that, so that would be additionally, we reiterate our call for a moratorium on now how stake all high stakes testing for the 20, 20, 2021 school year so our students can benefit from the time being, from the time being focused on instructions and uh, they are urgent, the legislature to enact a moratorium on high stake testing for three years. So it's not just the 2022, uh, 2021, but it's for the next three years. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on this one? In fairness, given everything that's taking place, um, you know, it would be awesome for our students to focus on learning versus being stressful with, uh, you know, learning to the test. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. So is the committee in favor of uh, supporting this resolution? We need to take a vote? Or? Yeah, we should take a vote. Yeah. Okay. Just, so would like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve resolution number one. Uh, a second? I'll second. Thanks, Libby. Um, Ms. Chung? Aye. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? I'm sure she's an aye. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you call my name? Aye. Aye. Yeah. aye. Okay. Liza? Okay. I'm an aye as well. Okay. Moving on to number two, as I had stated, um, we already uh, approved number two previously, maybe three or four months ago, uh, which is, has to do with state uh, uh, COVID-19 state funding. Um, lucky us, I keep using the wrong mouse. I keep trying to move my mouse. I, I, ch I had to change computers, so now I'm using two computers. Uh, so this one here has to do with uh, COVID-19 state funding, whereas if schools are to reopen this fall, in the midst, the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, it is the responsibility of each school district to do safely and responsibly. And uh, if I can move up. And therefore be, be resolved that the state must guarantee every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID-19 expenses are required to follow state mandates. We must ensure a statewide school reopening that it is safe, responsible, and equitable. Uh, there can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. So, you know, we are lucky in Plymouth County uh, that, uh, you know, our expenses uh, for COVID-19 will be covered by um, the, the, the county government. Uh, so this is essentially already covered, but I think if the committee would like for us to step up and actually offer an amendment, uh, you know, and the amendment would be essentially something to the extent of, uh, you know, uh, that I could actually present at the uh, at the, co the conference, that the city of Boston, along um, Plymouth County uh, school public schools, because we have uh, funds coming from. Both, you know, the city of Boston is the city of Boston, and uh, Plymouth County is from the county government. Uh, the, any 
uh, expenses for COVID-19 not covered by the county government in Boston and the city of Boston uh, that they got, that we would ask the uh, state government to cover those expenses. So we just got to paraphrase it, uh, but if you follow what I'm saying, uh, this would be actually, uh, we would be taking the leadership in mission if somebody didn't think of that already. Uh, what, what do you guys think about that? Yes, John. Can I, can I just suggest one, one issue, Carlos, maybe to, you know, make this, uh, this thing extend to the end of COVID-19 instead of December 30th of 2020, you know what I mean? If we could, if we could be an advocate of trying to do that, that would be um, helpful to us, I think. Spin thoughts end of the COVID-19. And I think, John, for your information, too, they are looking to apply for additional funds, even the county, uh, because obviously this is going to be taking us uh, beyond uh, yeah. December 31st. It'd just be nice so to know we have likely. them, you know what I mean? That, that you know, it just would be, I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. So just the more the information they get, the better. Yeah, so thank you. Any other suggestions? I mean, it would, would uh, I think if we can come up with an amendment, it would be a great thing, right? Yeah, I think those are both great suggestions. Mm -hmm. Well, but Carlos, the, the resolution just, uh, it has the state not guaranteed us reimbursement for not, anything? Not, uh, no. I mean, uh, from initially, uh, what happened is because uh, Boston, the city of Boston, Employment County, uh, opt to apply for that fund, the, the director of ANF came out and said, if the Plymouth County in the city of Boston is keeping their money, that they would not be offered any additional money. So that $225 pay student, uh, we are not part of that. So from what I understand, understand it would be, we will be out uh, because supposedly the county is the one reimbursing okay. us. And uh, using their own for own, their own formula. All of the state is different from the but county. This formula. this resolution says that the state must guarantee every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID nineteen expenses are required to follow state mandates. So, even those other districts that are getting the two twelve per student, they're not getting all of their expenses covered. They, they, so everybody's yeah. in mean, the same right. boat. So um, I think, I don't know if we have to change this one. I think there's another resolution about supporting increased federal support, which yeah, I think it's number nine, I believe. Uh, five. So maybe that's the one we're extending, because the December 31st deadline is the federal funds, correct? It is. It is the federal fund under the CARES Act, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is also covered. Uh, yeah, which is also covered under COVID-19, unless they did not address that. So five, yeah, they're I mean, only support. It's supporting the fed. That's the federal support. So the way you're reading, you think number five is the one addressing actually uh, the COVID-19 that we are getting from the county? Um, because you were right. I mean, they are the federal money, right? Well, yeah, and then that's what the state's using for the other districts, the, the federal money that the state got. Um, I, I I think it's it's already covered in here because they're saying to cut full reimbursement for whatever are required to follow state mandates, and every DESE guideline is a state mandate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and what we can do too is the ones that we have a, a, you know, a question. I can always follow up with you know with the resolution. Yeah, we can revote it next week, but I don't think. <coughs> necessarily need to to change anything into that <coughs> county okay all right so leave it alone uh with that 
I'll make a, a motion to approve resolution number two. Second. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Roll call. Is it Michelle? Aye. Jen? Jen? I'm sorry. I just lost all audio and um, <laughs> Down and I just got it back. So we're voting on resolution, resolution okay. two. All right. So I, uh, I, thank you. Okay. Aye. Ness. I. Carlos. I. Libby. I. Liza. I. And I'm an I as well. Um, what I was thinking, Carlos, if you're okay with it, maybe go up through the first five, and then we can do the next five yeah, at our next meeting. That's fine. That work? Okay. That's right. And I apologize too, because I'm working on two computers. I had a little problem earlier. All right, so number three is the school committee on anti-racism resolution. Again, this one was also approved uh, a month or two ago. Uh, so we just, it, it is the exactly same resolution. Uh, I know that Nez had made the motion earlier. So Nez, I will give you the honor, if you don't mind, uh, to make this motion. I will make a motion to adopt the resolution number three, school committee anti-racism resolution. I'll second. Okay, we'll do roll call. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Yes? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I am an I as well. And number four, uh, essentially, is uh, calling on the legislatures to lower the voting age for municipal elections, whereas the right to vote is elemental to the democracy, and the right uh, that the right should be protected and guaranteed uh, to all qualified citizens. Um, and reboot. If I can go back. Um, therefore, it be resolved that the sponsors of um, the the, expo the sponsors of this bill, which is the Empower Act, call upon the Massachusetts legislatures to pass the Empower Act and take other means necessary to allow. Uh, citizen towns to establish a minimum voting age of 16 years uh, for our municipal election. So this is just essentially trying to change uh, the law to allow you know, young adults to vote earlier than 18 years old. I think it's great. <laughs> you want to um, make yeah, that motion? I'll make a motion to... Um, to adopt resolution four, lowering the voter age for municipal elections. I'll second that. Okay, well, um, any discussion? Yep. Okay, Michelle? Aye. Jen? You're muted, Jen. Aye. Ness? Aye. Aye. And Liza? Actually, yeah, no on this one. Okay. And you must be your, your daughter's looking you. <laughs> I just, I can't. As Liza had alluded to, it's important increase federal support. Uh, in the stimulus fund for public K through 12 education. Uh, I asked the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic is a monumental and unprecedented challenge emerging quickly and demanding an immediate uh, overhaul for the instructional plans and the strategies for school systems across the country. Therefore, It be resolved that the Massachusetts Association of the School Committee petition the Attorney General of Massachusetts to review and recommend to the Executive Office of Education 
in the Massachusetts Department of Elementary Education to review the formal la language of uh, such a statute. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Carlos, I think you're reading the therefore from Resolution 6. Am yeah. I? So, I'm saying it looks like therefore for be it resolved that MASC align with the state superintendents. You know, I uh, for some reason that page. Where is that page? Did some someone want to read that for me because I cannot find the page. Yeah, it's the same page. I can read it for you. It's on the left hand column. Um, therefore, be it resolved that the MASC align with state superintendents okay. of schools and urge the Massachusetts congressional delegation and state legislators advocate and for and approve and approve additional education funding for our nation's public schools through the United progressive tax legislation. Thank you. I will second that. Oh. Are you going to make a motion? Okay. Wait, I'll second. make a motion. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, Michelle. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay, so th thank you very much, Carlos. And we can take up uh, uh, 6 through 10 at the next sure. meeting. That's good. Everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. All right, 7.3, to hear a proposal by the superintendent to utilize remote learning in place of emergency snow days and act as appropriate. Okay, um, at the risk of offending the seniors at high school who wait for the one year that snow <laughs> days don't count, um, <laughs> this year, given the uh, circumstances we're in, um, the commissioner is allowing us to utilize remote learning uh, during any day that it will be a snow day. So we avoid having to extend our calendar. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, a great idea. We do have the remote in place uh, and I fully support that. And I'm, and I'm making that recommendation to you that you allow us to do it. It is a one year deal. This is only for this year, um, just due to the circumstances. Uh, but I do make that recommendation and, uh, that we utilize uh, remote learning uh, during any day that is inclement uh, where we would be remote only. Is there any discussion or questions from the committee? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, Laura Nachitella? Sorry, Laura. It's not, or, Laura, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, Laura Nachitella, Fort Boulder Glen Road. I just want to say thanks for um, the small step. I think the community would like to see more small steps like this. Um, I understand there's a lot of the barriers to doing K through two, but I think uh, the administration in this committee really needs to look at taking the small steps that can be taken, steps like these, steps like maybe if you can't do K through two, then start with kindergarten and have kindergarten get back in there. So please, please, if there are obstacles that are just too surmountable to do these bigger things, will you please look for more things like this and take some action? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the utilization of uh, uh, authorizing the superintendent to utilize remote learning in place of emergency snow days for the 2020-2021 school year. Second. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Ness. Aye. Carlos. Aye. Libby. Aye. Liza? Aye. And I as well. 7.4 is to appoint Ness Parenti as school committee liaison to the equity task force. Um, Dr. Lavilla was kind enough to invite a school committee member to participate, and thank you, Ness, for volunteering. Uh, 7.5 is to consider the homeschool applications for three students for fiscal year 2021 and act as appropriate. Somebody would like to make a motion? I move that we approve the homeschooling application of the three students uh, on grade one, grade three, and grade six. I'll uh, second. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? 
Hi. I'm an I as well. Uh, 7.6 says to receive notification of the appointment for the 2020-2021 school year of Tracy Manning, grade four education teacher as a half-time full FTE at South Elementary School. Well, welcome, Trace. One is to receive of their number of appointments um, for parent educators and long-term subs. Um, so thank you, everyone, and welcome. Uh, number eight is subcommittee and project reports. Um, Michelle? Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, special ed, we are going to meet next Thursday at 9 a.m., I believe we settled on 9 a.m. Um, so we'll have that meeting. Um, I will get that posted and with the agenda. Um, I think it's at school council for the high school is actually tomorrow night at five o'clock and that's the first one. So Ness, I might be late to the finance subcommittee um, meeting. Wednesdays, finance mm -hmm. subcommittee. Or Wednesday, sorry. Okay. Yes, sorry, Wednesdays. Um, so, sorry, it's almost tomorrow. I mean, it's almost Tuesday now. So I meant, uh, <laughs> so sorry. So I will miss up some of that. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's it. Although, Paul, I would like to circle back with you to schedule another um, coffee with Medco parents. Oh, good. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. okay thank you. Jen? Uh, just that I attended the school council meeting at Foster on October 14th, and then the next one we meet again on November 4th. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ness? I have a couple updates. Um, East, we have our first student council meeting on October 28th, and then I just heard from the PTO president who mentioned that they have a drive-in that happened last week that was real, really successful. Um, they're going to have um, different things that they're trying to do this year with the community, trying to do outreach with the community during COVID. It's, it's difficult, um, but they're thinking of different ideas, and one is um, rolling out one book, one school, one community initiative. Uh, and then the other update is HEF. We met on October 7th, um, discussed fundraising efforts in the COVID world. Um, and given that Code Red program has finished its three year um, last year, they are planning to do a grant based program this year. Um, and the goal this year is to support the teachers who are persevering in these hard times. Um, applications will be accepted starting uh, November 1st and going through November 20th. Great. Thank you. Um, can I, sorry, sorry, can I just ask or mention something in the nest? I think you had spoken to Jamie about this particular thing maybe earlier today, but on the um, equity task force, taking up the idea, um, acknowledging the um, indigenous land that we are on. Um, so if you need any help with that, let me know because I've done some research on it. It was an idea that a um, teacher brought forth and I think it's a great idea. But if you need help yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. okay. And did, did you have any call today? Me? And um, he is going to be reaching out to the PTOs to get community engagement now. So I'm going to participate in that process. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. So, uh, SNAP, I uh, attended another meeting, second meeting uh, last week. A uh, great group of uh, individuals, including Carrie Nee. <laughs> uh, they do amazing things for our special needs uh, students. Um, my first PIS uh, uh, school council will be happening on Wednesday, the 21st. Um, we are planning our first uh, capital and facilities uh, subcommittee meeting for the 27th, um, we do have uh, finally uh, the budget uh, signed by the governor, $45.5 billion. Uh, with, with, we, I believe we heard many times that there was experience in the shortfall uh, of $3.6 billion, which will be addressed by a new uh, opioid uh, tax uh, proposal that will be applied um, you know, uh, to the manufacturers um, and, you know, and also 1.35 billion that will be uh, utilized from the rainy day fund. Um, and I believe that covers all my uh, groups. Thank right. you. Thank you, Carlos. Libby? Hi. Uh, we might video. Here we go. 
So um, community outreach has scheduled two coffees with the superintendents, and one, the first one is Friday, November 6th at 9 a.m., and the second one is Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m. So we invite everybody to come and speak cordially with the superintendent. And I would like to just say that our superintendent, Dr. Austin, is managing this situation in an unbelievably uh, positive manner under extreme stress and duress and pressure. And I would like to suggest that everybody who attends these coffees think very carefully ahead of time about how they will be phrasing their questions and their comments to keep it positive. You can seek information, that's fine, but keep your accusations to yourself. Our administrators are not your punching bag. We get it that you're frustrated. We're all frustrated. But you really, really need to be extremely careful about how you go about seeking information during these coffees. And uh, I'm going to have a time limit, and I'm also going to be uh, judging your questions and comments. So I, I please ask you to come and attend, but keep it positive, please. So we have two coffees, and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Libby. That's it. Liza? Uh, um, salary negotiations, we'll give you an update in executive session after this. Um, master plan, we meet again on Wednesday, and then the middle school school council is meeting on October 26th. Great, thank you. Um, policy is meeting Wednesday, October 28th to finish up section I, which is instruction and to begin assessing section D, which is financial management. Um, so next is, are there any warrants this week, Ness? Sorry, yes, there was one that I signed, it's in the packet. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'll be back in tomorrow to find some more. Makes sense. Uh, other items as may not reasonably be known, within 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Does anyone have anything? Okay, seeing none, um, I will take a, a motion to adjourn to executive session. I'll make a motion to adjourn to executive session, not to return to open session for the purposes of approving minutes of the executive session held on September 21st, 2020, and discussing strategy related to collective bargaining negotiations with HEA Unit A and B the public discussion of which may be detrimental to the committee's bargaining position. Thank you. Do we have a second? second. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? You're, you're muted. Aye. Thanks. Libby? Aye. Liza? Aye. And I am, and I as well. So the meeting is adjourned at 10:29 p.m.